Good morning. I will now call the December 14th San Diego County Board of Supervisors regular meeting to order. The clerk will call the roll. Thank you, Chair Fletcher. Uh, I would like to note for the record that Supervisor Desmond will be absent from today's meeting. And with that, Supervisor Anderson? Here. Supervisor Lawson Reamer? Vice Chair Vargas? Vargas here. And Chair Fletcher? Fletcher here. The uh, first item on the order of business is a report of actions taken in closed session. I'll ask County Council to report any items. Good morning. Uh, the Board of Supervisors met in closed session on December 13th from 1.02 to 1.38 p.m. and took the following reportable action. On item 37D with four board members voting aye and Supervisor Desmond absent, the board authorized County Council to initiate litigation. Particulars about the litigation will be discussed to any, disclosed to any person upon inquiry after litigation has formally commenced. End of report. Thank you. First on the agenda today is non-agendized public communication, an opportunity for the public to address the board on matters that are within our jurisdiction but are not on today's agenda. The only action the board may take is a referral to the chief administrative officer. Reminder, according to Rule 4A, members of the public who are non-English speaking and need interpretation assistance will be allotted additional time to facilitate translation. According to the rules of procedure, we will hear from five in-person speakers and five virtual speakers. Any remaining requests for non-agendized public communication will be resumed at the conclusion of our agendized business. I'll ask the clerk at this time to call forward up to five in-person and five virtual non-agenda public speakers. Thank you, Chair Fletcher. We have 19 total requests to speak on matters not listed on the agenda, four in-person and 15 coming by phone. For those that have requested to speak via phone, if you could please dial into the conference line now using the instructions that were provided to you. We will begin with the in-person speakers. As your name is called, if you could please come forward and stand against the east wall under the murals until it is your time to speak. You'll have two minutes to address the board, and I would like to invite forward the following individuals. Summer Light, Audra, Consuelo, and Catherine Rhodes. And if you could please begin by stating your name before you begin your comments. Hello, Summer Light. I'm speaking on behalf of the Elfin Forest community, addressing Tara Lasso Reamer. We know, Tara, that you value and safeguard our beautiful habitats and open space. This is exactly what the community Elfin Forest sponsors fundraisers for. There is one issue we've been trying to resolve, and we need your help. Reclaimed asphalt has been brought to the San Marcos landfill. It is being used on roads that have easily been driven without it for years. Worst of all, the Department of Public Works dumped toxic asphalt on a beautiful 12.5 acre parcel designated as buffer land and to be left untouched as a natural wildlife preserve. In 2005, the San Diego Board of Supervisors voted to spend 350,000 to have the San Marcos landfill blend in with the surrounding communities. Thank you, we love that. A beautiful habitat was created and it is now being destroyed. 
we have proof of multiple violations. We have consulted a paving and grading company and they told us it would be less than a day's work to remove the asphalt from this buffer parcel, approximately $1,500. This is our community ask, as well as preventing further destruction. If you can take action now, our open space buffer will have time to restore itself with the coming rains. Thank you. Um, hello, this is Catherine Rhodes, and this is actually for Chair Nathan Fletcher. I think you should run and be our mayor. And here's how I thought about it last night. Um, the governor's gonna have four years. You're gonna have four years. Two years, you could, or four years, you can run for governor. Two years, you can run for mayor of San Diego. What that will do, you won't have to go to any meetings. Todd Gloria goes to zero meetings, zero. Zero, <laughs> literally, he doesn't ever show up. Um, you would have all this opportunity to run for governor if you were the mayor. And you would also get to be on to the, um, you know, the, the council of cities and the council of counties up in Sacramento or wherever they meet, and you could meet all the different people. So I think that you being our mayor would be fantastic. And so the reasons why. Today um, in the paper, Todd Gloria said we can't put tents, just tents, over at the 20th and B Street station because it will flood. Perfect, well, it's not perfect, but the solution is in your Appendix P, your a voluntary Appendix P in the 2019 California Building Code, which says you have to have a four inch level, level um, a platform every place you have a, a tent. It's no big deal. He also um, tries to say that we can't have, um, we can't have a safe parking lot in Mission Bay at the South Shores because it's dedicated parkland and it would be illegal. He uses this illegal thing when we know now that you guys opened, you and the city opened up the sprung shelter in the Midway area without secret review. All you did is did a notice of exemption. Please think about, just think about running for mayor in 2024 because we have nobody else that I could think of that could beat Todd Gloria and you could. Thank you. Consuelo, saying one thing and doing another, that's hypocrisy. Saying, one, saying many things and doing nothing, that's democracy. Remember to the people, the few fighting, remember who you are. Those who love truth in the last days of this system will be the most hated. Remember who you are. We are the only responsible for what we say, not what they understand. Remember who you are. You weren't meant to be slaves to their system. My brothers and sisters, you were meant to destroy their system. Remember who you are. They lied to your grandparents, which means they lied to your parents, which means in turn they lied to you. Don't lie to your children. Generations of passing down lies is why we're still suffering. Wake up, people. Last I say to you, the statist slaves, the ones who have bought into all of it, the biggest mistake you could make with us conspiracy theorists is that you think we want to be right. Believe you me, we wish we were wrong. Know this, every single bit of chaos is being created on purpose. Every last nonsensical bit. The purpose is for when the time comes, you will be begging for order, their order. It's all orchestrated, all of it. The government is an intergenerational and highly complex criminal organization. The media is the marketing branch of this organization. Together they stand as the two pillars of the biggest scam in world history. Once you understand that, the solution wasn't created to solve the problem, but the problem was intentionally created for the solution to be rolled out. Then you will comprehend the magnitude of evil in the people behind everything. They control because you obey. Remember who you are. Use the name Andra. I don't know what's so funny over there, but sure. 
Um, you know, it's sad, Nathan, that yesterday you're claiming that I actually wanted to be abused again by the officers. That's atrocious because, I mean, I had a seizure a couple weeks ago because of this. So it's great. Yeah, I don't want my head slammed into the ground again. What I want is for you guys to uphold your oath. This is a constitutional republic, not a democracy. You took an oath to uphold the Constitution and defend that against all enemies, foreign and domestic. And I'm not your enemy, so doing what you're doing is not constitutional. It's actually violating your oath. It's a federal offense. And the fact that you're sending people to abuse me, it's like you got a little button back there that you can just like call the sheriff and have them show up like it's, I just robbed a bank. And it's like they hated Jesus. Look what they did to him because he was sharing the truth. So just like Consuelo was saying, it's like we're hated because we're sharing the truth. And you hate us so much that you like want me to be assaulted by your own men. Even your own staff, James Canning. And it's like... Where do you go from here when, when I can't, like, who do you tell when it's the sheriff that assaults you? Who do you go to? I should be able to come to you, but you're the one that sicks them on me. And it's like, God forbid that would happen to anybody in your family, but you're willing to do it to other people. And it's like, at what point do you actually, like, reach down to that little boy that's still inside of you and go, like, why am I doing this? Why am I hurting people when I'm claiming? Thank you. Now we will hear from those that have requested to speak by phone. Again, we will be hearing from the first five callers. The remaining callers will be heard at the conclusion of today's session. When it is your turn to speak, you'll be unmuted and you will hear a recording that will tell you to begin your comments after the beep. Again, I would like to remind the callers they should mute their TV or live video stream before they begin speaking. And we will begin with our first caller. And again, if you could please state your name before beginning your comments. Good morning, Ann Riddle, parent advocate. I phoned in this morning because we out in the North County and East County live a really long way away from the Board of Supervisors meeting, and I wouldn't want you to think that our lack of attendance means that we don't care. We really do appreciate the opportunity to call in. There were two items yesterday that captured the concerns of the parent community. One was the vote to extend the use of Narcan and the locks on, uh, throughout the county, a wonderful, wonderful proposition because saving lives is certainly important. But I recently uh, attended a county presentation on Narcan and Noxalon and where and the Loxon where it's used and who's using it. And we found that one third of the people who have been saved by Narcon, it was their third time from being saved using Narcan. And I think we have to ask our ourselves the question, three times they've now had that experience. Yes, we're glad their lives were saved, but are we carefully examining their use of illegal drugs? that created the opportunity to have them contaminated? Are we reaching in and understanding the journey that brings people to that place in their lives? Are we looking at the first drug abuse that happened in young people and the first drug experiences which generally occur with smoking or vaping and primarily are tobacco and marijuana? Are we looking at those drugs and beginning at the start of where the drug using journey begins and really getting to that solution? along with keeping people alive at the end of that solution, uh, the end of that problem. The second thing that concerned me was item 34, the uh, cannabis grant that was supposed to solve social inequities. I'd just like to say that as a reparation for communities of color, giving them the opportunity to run a marijuana business, this is no idea of solving this. Thank you, your time is up. We'll go to the next caller. Barbara Gordon, um, at the board meeting yesterday, 
Um, it was very disappointing and concerning to see the board vote to now allow illegal drug activity in housing. I urge the board to consider developing an alternative policy that would protect tenants and property owners from illegal drug activity in affordable housing. As someone who works with property managers and tenants, it's hard to believe this board would consider that policy change. If your goal is to provide equitable access to underserved communities, to invest in vulnerable populations by expanding the availability of affordable housing, with this change, you will not achieve that goal when allowing drug activity in multi-unit housing. When drug use or drug dealing is taking place on property, everyone suffers, the drug user, the tenant, the landlord, and the neighborhood. Tenants who pay their rent deserve to live in a safe environment. Families need to know that their children can play safely outside. If you care about the residents, I urge you to develop an alternative policy that would not tolerate illegal drug activity in housing. Thank you for letting me speak. Thank you. We'll go to the next caller. Good morning. My name is Suzanne Hume. I'm the educational director and founder of CleanEarthForKids.org. As you know, there is no safe level of lead, and a small bit of lead dust permanently harms children's brains forever. And lead harms kidneys, livers, and reproductive systems, etc. People of all ages and our wildlife. Today, we're asking again if the County Board of Supervisor will please direct staff to follow the example of the County of Santa Clara, California, to stop the sale, use, and storage of leaded aviation fuel at all San Diego airports, including Carlsbad Airport, Gillespie, Fallbrook, San Diego International, Ramona, and others. And please direct staff at the County Health Department to include eight sources of lead, which include aviation fuel, synthetic turf, wood smoke, and tobacco smoke as sources of lead. This needs to be on your website. And please send out a mailer to all San Diego residents about the harms of lead. Please stop the sale of aviation fuel at all of the county airports. Also, the public needs to know lead is in much, much of our plastic. And please do not install any more synthetic turf. As you know, plastic grass, it's made of plastic, right? And so um, lead has been found, PFAS, which are forever chemicals, and many other toxic chemicals have been found in synthetic turf. And as you know, the NFL Players Union and others want to play on natural grass. Synthetic turf is expensive, millions of dollars for a small field. Instead, use drainage. Did you know that you can get a beautiful, resilient grass playing field from a dirt lot? Well, we did that in Irvine. So please check out cleanersforkids.org. There are many resources for you. We need to keep our kids Thank safe. Thank you. Your time is up. We'll go to the next caller. To the caller, you can begin your comments. Please state your name for the record. Good morning. My name is John Baudorf with CleanEarthForKids.org. Lead is a toxic heavy metal with no safe level. It is a cumulative poison that does not break down in the environment and is especially toxic to children and unborn babies. It damages their brains and nervous systems, lowers IQ scores, arms muscle coordination, speech, language, and causes behavior problems. There is lead in aviation fuel. According to EPA data, aircraft at Gillespie Field dumps over 1,100 pounds of lead into the air every year. Palomar Airport, over 700 pounds, and Ramona, over 600 pounds. That is over 2,400 pounds of lead in our air every year from county airports, and there is no safe level of lead. 
A 2013 San Diego Air Pollution Control District study showed that Palomar Airport exceeded national ambient air quality standards for lead. That was 10 years ago. Studies show lead hurts kids' brains, leading to lower reading and math test scores and higher rates of suspension and detention, high school dropout rates, and crime and time spent in prison. For every five micrograms per deciliter increase in blood lead levels, the risk of failing reading and math tests increases by a third. Kids in Flint, Michigan, saw a 30% drop in reading proficiency because of lead. A study done by the County of Santa Clara found children living within a half mile of their airport had lead levels nearly twice that of kids during the Flint water crisis. They have stopped leaded fuel at their airport. Please take action and get the lead out of all county airports and all airports in the region. Please protect our kids and immediately stop the sale, use, and storage of leaded fuel. There is unleaded aviation fuel available. Please go to our website, Team 5, get the lead out page on our website for more information on the dangers of lead. Thank you from cleanearthforkids.org. Thank you. And we will go to our final caller. Good morning. My name is Diane Grace. I'm a mother and grandmother and have volunteered on many youth projects in North County, especially projects involving promoting good health choices. Yesterday, a speaker mentioned a powerful webinar that many parents and educators listened to. It was entitled, Where Does Cannabis Go in the Body and How It May Affect Teenagers' Brains? To recap, the presenter was a highly regarded researcher who had been studying the effects of cannabis compounds on behavior and brain, rate and brain regions since 2000 over 20 years of research. She described the adolescent brains and the effects of the psychoactive compound tetrahydrocannabinoid, THC, the main component of marijuana for the developing brain. The resulting negative outcome is overwhelming for young adults and the family members who care about them and for them. The journey into adulthood with its education and economic demands, is difficult at best. To be burdened with intellectual and emotional challenges brought on by vaping and ingesting marijuana is just plain cruel. Marijuana businesses are nefarious in their predatory advertising and snaring youth into vaping and using marijuana. The repercussions of marijuana businesses is that it normalizes marijuana use to teens and young adults as some sort of default choice for relieving stress and anxiety. I feel that our county's live well dream is being stolen by marijuana businesses and commercialization in the county's back country. Thank you for listening. Thank you. And for the remaining callers that requested to speak on a matter not listed on the agenda, if you could please hang up and call back at the conclusion of the session. Chair Fletcher, that concludes the request for non-agenda public communication this morning. Next on our agenda is approval of the statement of proceedings minutes for the regular meeting of November 16, 2022. I'll make a motion to approve. Is there a second? Second. Second by Vice Chair Vargas. Please vote. Supervisor Anderson, aye. Chair, uh, Vice Chair Vargas, aye. and Chair Fletcher. Fletcher, aye. That motion passes unanimously with all supervisors who are present voting aye. We are going to uh, switch the order. We will do consent calendar after we do our discussion items. We'll do our discussion items, we'll come back and do consent, uh, and then after that we will do our housing workshop. So we will go first to item nine, no notice public hearing. Uh, San Luis Ray River approve acquisition of approximately 49 acres for inclusion in the river park and adoption of resolution. Uh, I'll make a motion to approve this item. Is there a second? Second. All right, we have a motion by myself, second by Vice Chair Vargas. Let's hear from any public speakers on discussion item number nine.
Thank you, Chair Fletcher. We have four total requests to speak, one individual in person, and three requesting to speak by phone. I'd also like to note for the record, we did not receive any e-comments on this item. Uh, any members of the public that have requested to speak on this item by phone, please dial into the conference line now using those instructions that were provided to you. We will begin with the in-person speakers. As your name is called, if you could please come forward and stand against the wall under the mural uh, until it is your turn to speak. And I would like to invite forward Audra. You'll have two minutes to address the board. And if you could please begin by stating your name for the record. Even though you just did. Okay. I use the name Audra. There we go. Um, you know, this property is surplus, I guess, and um, the master plan, like all your projects seem to go on for a long time. Like 2008, this master plan was approved for you guys to, you know, work, acquire land. But, you know, we talk about homelessness and it's like, I don't understand. I mean, you want to acquire 1717, 717 acres. So, why not use the land that you guys have to give people housing? Because every other project gets stopped from all your exempt, like CEQA and all this stuff. So I don't really understand why you guys, I mean, I know you wanna, you know, protect, preserve the land because you wanna, you know, pretend like you're doing something good. Um, with all this climate change crap, but there is a lot of land out there and I feel like you're not using it for people that are just up on this bridge over here, like doing stuff that isn't really helping people. Like you're just trying to help the land, but you're making the people suffer in the process of doing that. And that doesn't make sense to me. Um, and the fact that, you know, you're just accepting an appraisal that's, you know, $4,000 more per acre just because like, I don't know, nothing you guys do makes sense. And the fact, I mean, what's this staff gonna get paid $50,000 for? Is that one person? Is it five people? How many people is it? Nobody's ever gonna answer it. I just like to ask rhetorical questions or whatever, because it just bothers you guys. It's great. You just hate me so much. I just wanna stand up here for my 11 seconds. God bless each and every one of you. Thank you. Now we will hear from those that have requested to speak by phone. When it is your turn to speak, you'll be unmuted and you will hear a recording that will tell you to begin your comments after the beep. I'd like to remind the callers they should meet their TV or live video stream before they begin speaking and we will begin with our first caller. the county has spent over $27.7 million to acquire a total of 717 acres, which is only 45% of the planned San Luis Rey River Park. Caltrans owns a 49-acre property directly off State Route 76, and it's up for sale for about $2.9 million. But it can't be a good option because Jim and Nora's climate change cult said homes and people being near the highways is toxic because of GHG. The property is directly adjacent to the existing county-owned 68-acre Rio Prado Park site in Fulbrook. Upon acquisition, the two properties will be combined with direct and apparently, according to the climate change cult, toxic access to Rio Prado Park via State Route 76. You see, they can never keep up with their lives. Everything is contradictory, like wearing a mask to a board meeting and then taking it off five minutes later to speak. All of these land acquisitions are only to fulfill the United Nations Agenda 21 plan on biodiversity to keep people away from being able to live in rural areas in the future by claiming eminent domain, taking easement of or conserving as much land as possible. The taking of major parcels and acres of land is part of the reason why housing quantities can't seem low, can seem low because there's no longer land to build them on when extremist companies like BlackRock are intentionally buying up entire blocks of neighborhoods and replacing them with ugly stack and pack. The item's cost is over $3.1 million, plus annual property management cost of over $91,000. No wonder the park spending was said to be about $14 million total. Land monopoly by county government ain't cheap, 
but they always do it on the taxpayer's dime. And they can't even answer questions when people ask them. Everything becomes rhetorical. That we still see. Isn't that amazing? Thank you. Your time is up. And Chair Fletcher, not seeing any other callers calling in, that will conclude public comment on. Thank you. We have a motion by myself, second by Vice Chair Vargas, to approve the recommendations in item nine. Please vote. And Chair Fletcher, that motion passes unanimously with all supervisors who are present and voting aye. We're going to go to item number 10, notice public hearing, resolution to rescind the Harmony Grove Village South General Plan Amendment, specific plan rezone, vesting tentative maps, major use permit, site plan, and environmental impact report located in the San Guadalito community plan area. I'll make a motion to approve. Is there a second? Second. Motion by myself, second by Supervisor Anderson. Let's hear from our public speakers on item 10. Thank you, Chair Fletcher. We had seven total requests to speak, four individuals in person, and three requesting to speak by phone. I'd like to note that we did also receive one e-comment on this item. Any members that requested to speak on this item by phone, if you could please dial into the conference line now with the instructions that were provided to you. We will begin with the in-person speakers. As your name is called, if you could please come forward and state your stand against the east wall under the murals and tell it is your turn to speak. And I'd like to invite forward the following individuals. Kelvin, Deb uh, Deborah O'Neill, John and Audra. You will have two minutes to address the board and if you could please begin by stating your name for the audio record. Good morning, supervisors. My name is uh, Kelvin Barrios. I'm with uh, Labor's Local 89. I'm the Director of Government Affairs. I'm here on behalf of my business manager, Valentin Macedo, and our 4,000 members in San Diego County. We're here uh, in support of this item, in support of this project, and eventually do urge the supervisors to approve this. Uh, we do, uh, the, the developer for this project has agreed to use a skilled and trained uh, workforce uh, to work with our, our local union and our members, uh, and agreed to pay you know, good wages that also you know, go into their pension plans and healthcare. This is actually uh, a bit of a rare bird when it comes down to the housing world uh, on this type of these type of uh, projects. They don't usually work with our, our local unions, or you know, they, I'll be honest, they don't really pay well. Um, a lot of the housing projects that are going on in the county are minimum wage jobs or cash jobs. There's a lot of issues that the county has done a lot. There's been a lot of policies, um, Chair Fletcher, like the policy that you guys did last year around. Um, you know, the permitting and, you know, the transparency uh, regulations. Uh, there's a lot more that we can do, but we do want to say that in this case, we have, we have an agreement. They're working with local labor. We want to see this project done. Um, it's much needed housing. I believe it's like in excess of 400 units in an area that's not sprawl. Um, I'm sure uh, the staff will, you know, be discussing with the proponent at a later time. So I'm sure this is like the first step but we're here just to lend our support. I have some of our members um, here today also in serving the, the county meetings. You know, we do like bringing our membership here to see kind of like the policy making in action. It's always a, a fun day at the county. Um, so again, thank you. And, you know, Chair Fletcher, thank you for your service as chair. I know we didn't have an opportunity on non-agenda comment, but did want to say that we appreciate your service and really look forward to working with uh, future chair uh, Vargas. So thank you. Good morning. Uh, my name is John Dummer. I, I live in the uh, Harmony Grove community in uh, North San Diego County. I'm here to support uh, rescinding the approval of the Harmony Grove Village South development um, because we live in that. I live in that community and have experienced the fires that have gone through there and the difficult time we have um, with um, uh, evacuating. Uh, I think uh, I'm hoping that if this ever comes around that. that uh, we, uh, we consider, uh, I think the county is thinking about considering the, the fact that maybe they should uh, independently uh, uh, prepare fire studies. Uh, the fact that the last f fire study uh, thought it was okay to have only one exit in and out of that community um, tells you that it was bought and paid for uh, by the developer. And I, I think the county independently could do a much better job. Thank you very much. Hi, my name is Debbie O'Neill and I live in Harmony Grove and uh, this has been a long, long fight for us. 
And um, I appreciate the fact that you guys are gonna rescind it and I support that. And uh, like Jonathan said, I hope that uh, when the next development comes along, which you know obviously will because there's land there, um, that you look again at greenhouse gases, you look at uh, affordable housing, because this had no affordable housing, and then most importantly to me, my family and my neighbors, is that you, you look at the fire and the evacuation risk. And uh, I'm one of 75 people who are gonna be at the back end of everybody evacuating with the development coming out in front. And we only have one way in, one way out. So I think the next development should be required, as state law provides, that there be two exits for fire code. So um, I appreciate you guys doing the recension and thank you very much. Use the name Audra. So again, it's like there's these projects that come forward and then you know, I don't know if in 2018 you had these same CEQA requirements or not, but if a project takes so long, it's like then these new requirements come in and they have to fulfill them and it keeps the project from moving forward. And you guys talk about you wanting to get housing and it's like, but that's why it's like, what is more important, helping the people or climate change, which is totally bogus? It's man-made. So it's like, I mean, there's a reason there's a drought, because it's man-made. We could go drill for water, but we don't. We don't close the border, because we want fentanyl to come in. Like, all the things that you could do to make things go in a smooth fashion and like actually get people housing instead of, I mean, projects taking like 30 years, some of them. It's pretty ridiculous because it just keeps getting put off and you claim you wanna help with the housing, but it's like the more requirements you, and hoops you make people jump through, they're not gonna be able to finish that. And you can't even finish housing. So it's like, are you really trying to help? Or are you just trying to put up roadblocks and pretend that you're helping while getting more money to just do more stuff? Because it doesn't make sense to me why you would make people jump through so many hoops like that when you're claiming to want one thing and you're doing the opposite. You're making it impossible for them to do it. And if you really cared about people having housing, it's like you wouldn't care if they didn't have an ID or certain things. You wouldn't turn them away and be like, we can't give you housing because you don't have any identification, but let's let these illegals in and give them medical care and housing and money. And like the people in the United States are left behind. So, I mean, quit putting up all these roadblocks for people and allow them to build because. Thank you. We will now hear from those that have requested to speak by phone. When it is your turn to speak, you'll be unmuted and you'll hear a recording that will tell you to begin your comments after the beep. I'd like to remind the callers they should meet their TV or live video stream before they begin speaking and we will begin with our first caller. Thank you, uh, Chairman Fletcher and Board. My name is J.P. Federge. I'm the chair of the Harmony Girls Elder Forest Town Council. We initiated this lawsuit on behalf of our community. Thank you for rescinding the entire approval of this high-end housing project as required by court order. Our community spent thousands of hours volunteering on this, raised over 300,000 from community members, and we even started an annual Keeping It Real trail run and hike, seven years running now. Our community has suffered through a major devastating wildfire and sometimes more than one every single decade where there have been homes and lives lost. Most recently, the Copas fire burned down 30 homes in our area, the very same dead end road where this dangerous project was proposed adjacent to thousands of acres of flammable brush on conserved land. This is sprawl. The previous board unfortunately did not take this community's concerns seriously about wildfire safety and evacuation. Independent fire consultants noted that if this project were approved, quote unquote, catastrophic losses would not only be probable, but should be expected. Our analysis showed that it would take six to eight hours to evacuate everyone off this one single country road. Developers own study showed that it takes, uh, the fire can overwhelm the community in little as 60 minutes. Our own fire chief emailed the county privately to say that evacuation infrastructure was inadequate. Unconscionably, the previous board approved a waiver of California fire code, which required secondary egress, simply because the developer didn't want to spend the money. 
The era of sprawl development in fire-prone areas is over. Newland Sierra has been rejected by the courts by initiative and is now permanently dedicated to open space. Deposits like Otai and Lilac Hills are also examples of how the state, the county, and the courts do not support this type of development. We should never risk communities and open space for high-end luxury sprawl projects. Community of Harmony Grove and Elfin Forest, thank you, and ask that in the future you strongly weigh the risk that communities like ours face. We will not stop advocating for this. And in fact, we have spun off a well-funded new nonprofit that will focus on sprawl projects all over the county to ensure this doesn't happen again. Thank you, and you guys have a good day. Thank you. We'll go to the next caller. I wish I had the clip ready of Joel talking about the housing hoops they set, Audra. Would have been perfect. The Harmony Grove Village South Project is located two miles west of Interstate 15 and south of State Route 78. Nora, Jim, it's not green again. There's highways. This project includes 453 single-family and multifamily homes. So, of course, we have frivolous lawsuits from the Sierra Club, Elfin Forest, Harmony Grove Town Council, Endangered Habitats League, and the Cleveland National Forest Foundation. They do everything they can to block single-family homes. They only want United Nations Agenda 21, sustainable slate gray stack and pack prison block housing to be built. In 2020, a biased trial court ruled that the project's EIR violated CEQA based on inadequate GHG mitigation measures and found the project was inconsistent with the SANDAG Regional Plan. A corrupt organization that doesn't even represent San Diego County residents since they're an unelected board. So their opinion doesn't matter. Then in 2021, the Court of Appeal affirmed the trial court's ruling related to the GHG and affordable housing. The Court of Appeal reversed the trial court's ruling to the Sandag Regional Plan. Serves them right. On October 19th, the trial court then issued a revised order requiring the county to rescind the project approvals. All this intentional waste of time and money litigation is a complete ripoff to, to the developer to have everything rescinded after four years of investment because some extremist groups are well-funded and well-supported by traders. It reminds me of what you supervisors did when you approved the appeal for Marco Gonzalez when you knew there was a conflict of interest via his environmental health coalition you've given money to, his Coast Law Group, and its Coastal Environmental Rights Foundation. You guys are the same type of traders with- Thank you, your time is up. And Chair Fletcher, that concludes public comment on this item. Thank you, we have a motion by myself, seconded by Supervisor Anderson to approve the recommendations in item 10. Please vote. And Chair Fletcher, that motion passes unanimously with all supervisors who are present voting aye. We're going to go to agenda item number 11, developing the San Diego County Native Landscape Program, uh, an item originally brought forward by myself and Supervisor Lawson Reamer. I'll turn it over to staff for your presentation. Thank you. <clears throat> Good morning, Chair Fletcher and members of the board. I'm Kelly Bray, and I'm joined by Megan Kelly of Planning and Development Services, as well as Rami Tali. Perfect. Uh, we are here today to report back in the board's direction to develop options to encourage the use of native plants in landscaping across the region. Native plant landscaping increases regional biodiversity and climate resiliency, expands wildlife corridors, and reduces habitat fragmentation. Today's action is a request to direct staff to develop the San Diego County Native Landscape Program, implement phase one actions, and return with options for future phases. On May 5th, 2021, the Board of Supervisors provided direction to collaborate with the San Diego Regional Biodiversity Working Group to develop a comprehensive native plant landscaping policy for both public and private property that includes guidelines, reasonable requirements, incentives, and equity-based resources and training. Staff was also directed to engage with a diverse range of stakeholders and to return with options for a new San Diego County native plant landscaping policy. Native plants in San Diego grew and evolved before European contact to adapt to the region's unique ecological conditions that make the county one of the most biodiverse in the country. There are over 1,500 plants native to this region, 
including those that can be found in chaparral, oak woodland, grassland, conifer forest, and desert areas. In recent decades, climate change, wildfires, and habitat fragmentation from development have threatened these important ecosystems. Landscaping with native plants supports biodiversity and helps the natural environment be more adaptive and resilient to climate change impacts by increasing habitat for native animals, birds, and insects, and improving water conservation. By encouraging the use of native plants in landscaping, the county can support local demand for native plant products and professional services. These efforts support other county sustainability initiatives that support biodiversity and reduce greenhouse gas emissions, including the Biodiversity Resolution, Regional Decarbonization Framework, Climate Action Plan, Water Conservation and Landscaping Ordinance, and Multiple Species Conservation Program. Following board direction, staff began coordination with the San Diego Regional Biodiversity Working Group, which is comprised of regional experts in landscape ecology, design, conservation, and native plants. In June of this year, the group released their recommended actions for a San Diego County native landscaping program to complement regional conservation efforts and equitably incentivize and increase the use of native plants in landscaping. The working group proposed that instead of a policy, a program for public and private landscaped areas should be developed to allow for the use of education, incentives, and policy actions, and create flexibility in program development and implementation. In addition to working group coordination, staff used best practice research and broad outreach and engagement with a range of diverse stakeholders from the environmental, economic, community, landscaping, and nurse nursery industries to inform the development of the proposed program. Stakeholder feedback included strong support for the inclusion of tribal knowledge on respecting biodiversity as a guiding principle and for the development of educational and incentive program, programming. Stakeholders expressed concern about the county establishing new regulations for private development or creating a prescriptive plant list that would limit flexibility in landscaping plant selection and negatively impact the non-native nursery industry. This feedback has been incorporated into the proposed, proposed program framework. Support of tribal ecological knowledge and biodiversity are included in the program objectives, and the framework will create a voluntary program that uses education and incentives and offers best practice design and installation recommendations, rather than requirements, to increase the use of native plants and landscaping. We will now outline the program framework and proposed actions. Six proposed program objectives establish the desired long-term outcomes identified by the working group and stakeholders. These include expansion of adaptive and resilient landscapes to buffer natural areas, support for the county's outdoor water use reduction goals through the use of native plants and landscaping, support for native wildlife and pollinators through landscaping plant selection, design, and placement, Support for the local nursery economy and landscaping industry by developing educational materials and strengthening local demand for native plant products and services. Support of equity-oriented outreach and tribal ecological knowledge to strengthen personal connections with the local environment and the development of resources that are easily accessible from the program website and support the use of native plants and landscaping throughout the region. Collectively, these objectives serve as guiding principles for a comprehensive program that addresses board direction to increase native plants and landscaping across the region, with some efforts focusing on the unincorporated area in application. Next, we will present 10 proposed county-initiated actions and the implementation timeframe that make up the program. Two actions outline policy recommendations, including the development of a native plant landscaping design manual as an appendix to the county's landscaping ordinance that would outline native plant landscaping objectives, establish design and installation recommendations, and identify priority areas based on their ability to align with regional conservation goals and equity considerations for program implementation. Action two is to amend board policy G15 to require native plant landscaping at new county facilities and in major county facility landscape retrofits with accommodations for recreational and other socially desirable uses to demonstrate commitment to the program objectives. 
Five actions are proposed that would develop educational materials for the community with a focus on residents, landscaping professionals, and school-aged children in collaboration with regional partners to increase the awareness of the benefits of native plants and to drive demand for locally sourced nursery stock. Action three is to develop a regional interactive website dedicated to showcasing all program resources, including native plant landscaping educational materials, training resources, and design support for residents that would be accessible in all county threshold languages. Action four is to develop and deliver instructor-led and web-based educational materials for both residents and landscaping professionals on the design, installation, maintenance, and cultivation of native plants. Action five would develop a funding structure for a network of demonstration gardens and educational materials to provide nature and ecological education for children. Action six would develop and a certification program to recognize landscaping professionals trained in native plant landscaping design and maintenance to help showcase native plant landscaping education as a marketable skill in the industry. Action seven would install native plant demonstration gardens at county facilities, such as at libraries, parks, or other facilities throughout the region. Three actions propose incentive recommendations that would make it easier for residents and businesses to use native plants in landscaping. Action eight would implement landscape retrofit pilot projects in rural and semi-urban underserved communities to test programmatic and incentive options that will encourage native plant landscaping at private property within the unincorporated area. Action nine would allow the county to use the lessons learned from the pilot projects and existing county programming, such as the waterscape rebate program, to develop a native plant landscaping incentive program for private development in the unincorporated area. Action 10 is to build a region-wide web-based tool for developing landscape design templates on the program website. This action would offer residents easy to use tailorable plans for installing native plant landscaping in the defensible space zone and fire prone areas, along wildlife corridors, and to establish pollinator habitat, among other examples. The 10 program actions are designed to be developed using a phase approach to allow for flexibility to incorporate lessons learned with each new phase. As the program is developed and implemented, staff will continue to seek public input by developing an inclusive community advisor group that would include working group members and other regional native plant experts, landscaping professionals, and residents and business owners to help identify important resources, examples, and lessons learned from the field to ensure that the program is informed by stakeholders and is centered on equity. Program implementation would occur over three phases. Five of the actions would be implemented during phase one to lay the foundation for future program actions. This phase will last three years beginning in fiscal year 2022 to 23 and result in an estimated cost of $297,000 to develop the design manual and educational materials and install demonstration gardens at county facilities. Staff will fund these actions with existing departmental budgets or future grants or return with funding requests as part of the annual budget process, depending on the responsible department. This work will be completed by Planning and Development Services, Departments of General Services, Public Works, and Parks and Recreation, and the San Diego County Library, Library in collaboration with regional partners. Phase two would run for two years, beginning in fiscal year 2025 to 26, and phase three will begin in fiscal year 2027 to 28. Staff would return to the board after phase one with options for implementation of phase two and three actions, including estimated costs. There are four recommendations related to today's request. First, staff recommend the board find the proposed actions exempt from the California Environmental Quality Act. The second recommendation is to develop the San Diego County Native Landscape Program that includes the six program objectives, 10 county initiated actions, and implementation timeframe. The third recommendation is to implement phase one actions. And the final recommendation is for staff to return to the board after phase one with options for implementation of future phases. Thank you, and that concludes our presentation. Staff are available for questions. 
Thank you. I, I really appreciate the really thorough presentation and all the work that's gone in to design this. Uh, I think we initiated this, and I think the team has done a really good job coming up with a comprehensive approach um, and, uh, and, and really a, a great standard for, for what we need to do and, and where we can go as a county. And I appreciate all the hard work that, that's gone into uh, to making this a reality and getting this to the point of launching phase one, but uh, having a long-term plan. Uh, multiple steps of what we do. You know, San Diego County, we're among the most biodiverse regions on the planet, and we want to make sure that we're conserving everything that makes us unique uh, and makes us special. Um, from Torrey Pines to our, our coastal, coastal sage scrub, uh, our coast live oaks, uh, some of my favorite at some of our county parks, uh, these native plants are really what makes San Diego County our county. Um, and so there's a real asset. They not just foster biodiversity, provide habitat, uh, facilitate our habitat corridors, uh, drought management, stormwater reduction, there is a lot of really important reasons why uh, the work and action we're taking here is important. Uh, not to mention, we have some incredibly beautiful plants that really add a, uh, a feel to our environment and a constant reminder of, of the incredible natural resources that are, are unique to us here in San Diego County. Uh, this is another example of a leading environmental policy that can help us achieve a lot of our sustainability goals. And so I'm incredibly supportive of what we're doing, uh, thrilled to uh, see the progress that's been made and really look forward to watching the implementation of this. And so thank you all um, for all the work. And with that, I'll make a motion to approve the recommendations in item 11. All right, and we'll go to Supervisor Lawson Reamer. And I appreciate Supervisor Lawson Reamer's work. And we co-docketed the uh, effort to initiate this action and uh, would love to turn it over to you before we hear from our public speakers. Thank you so much. Um, First of all, you all did a wonderful job, so thank you to our county team. But I also, to Kelly, thank you, thank you to everyone. Um, but also there was 57 members of our regional biodiversity working group. Uh, you all have been working selflessly, meeting, strategizing, thinking. Um, it's just really an impressive example um, of what it means to have community-based leadership um, and the community come together for something that is really important to all of us across San Diego County. Um, and I, in particular, would like to thank Clayton Schutte uh, because without him, this effort would 100% not be where it is today. So thank you, Clayton. I, I think um, we, we talk a lot about biodiversity, um, but I think it's important to really be specific about what that means, right? We were talking about 1,700 native species that are unique to our region. Um, we're talking about um, a, a a region across um, San Diego County that's increasingly facing droughts and um, biodiversity challenges uh, given climate change. And native plants help us increase drought tolerance, um, climate resiliency, preserve our local habitat, uh, help us mitigate against uh, stormwater runoff that then uh, pollutes our beaches and oceans. So there's so many, so many benefits. Um, I think this is also really good for our local economy. Uh, because it strengthens and expands the market for landscape design and nursery production and installation and maintenance services. And I know that across North County, um, you know, native plants have long been part of our, our economy and, and continue to, um, to build out that part of uh, our economic activity um, in a way that really roots um, those, uh, those jobs here in San Diego is a really important benefit as well. Um, so I'm happy to second this motion um, and just mostly just so excited to see this move forward. Thank you. Thank you. Let's go to our public speakers. Thank you, Chair Fletcher. We have 15 total requests to speak, two individuals in person and 13 requesting to speak by phone. I would like to also note for the record, we received 153 e-comments on this item, all in favor. For any members of the public that have requested to speak on this item by phone, if you could please dial into the conference line now using the instructions that were provided to you. We will begin with the in-person speakers. As your name is called, if you could please come forward and stand against the East Wall under the murals until it is your turn to speak. I would like to invite forward the following individuals, Mary and Audra. You will have two minutes to address the board, and if you could please begin by stating your name for the record. Good morning, Supervisors. My name is Mary Leesking. I'm the Blue Carbon Conservation Manager at Wild Coast. Wild Coast is an international team that conserves coastal and marine ecosystems and addresses climate change through natural solutions. We are in full support of the native landscaping program. San Diego County is a biodiversity hotspot, and native plants can support 10 to 50 times as many species of native wildlife when compared to non-native plants. 
Invasive species outcompeting native plants is one of the biggest threats to our blue carbon ecosystems, like our coastal wetlands. Non-native plants, such as eucalyptus trees, drop leaves and smother and outcompete the native understory vegetation that's sequestering and storing all of that carbon. This reduces diversity, alters nutrient cycling, and degrades the overall health of the wetlands. Healthy wetlands can sequester 10 times the amount of carbon and store up to five times the amount of carbon, uh, more carbon than terrestrial forests. But when they're degraded, like what happens when there's an invasive um, plant outbreak, the wetlands can go from an imp important carbon sink to a problematic carbon source. Native plants are one vital piece in the larger puzzle of keeping these ecosystems healthy and intact and continuing to store carbon for the hundreds and thousands of years to come. Much of the wetland restoration that Wild Coast does is removing invasive plants and planting native plants to restore the blue carbon ecosystems. This is necessary, but removals can be costly, and so buffering these critical habitats with native plants, as the program suggests, is a much more cost-effective and proactive step to protect the blue carbon resources. So we encourage you not only to support the program, but to make sure that you back your support with the necessary funding in the upcoming budget to ensure that successful implementation is possible. Thank you so much. Use the name Audra. So I'm carbon based. I'm wondering if you guys are trying to sequester me when you arrest me and stuff like that. Is that no? Okay, I don't know. I'm just curious. Um, but it's a little weird that you're trying to dictate what kind of plants people put in their property. Like, at what point are the people going to be like, quit asking for permission from people that are no different than you on what to do? It's like, can I plant these plants? No, you can't. And if you don't plant the right plants, you're not going to be able to build this house. So I'm sorry. You just have to follow the rules, right? These are the new rules for like all of society. You have to do it like this. And if you don't, we're going to punish you. But yet you guys do whatever you want. It's just nuts. Like, I don't understand. We need less government control on our lives. I mean, the fact that people are going to have some kind of guideline as far as what plants they want. It's a bit much. It's like total overreach of what your guys' duty is in this county. And so it's just I have a hard time. The more and more you want your hands in our lives to dictate stuff, I mean, it's ridiculous. Because we don't need you in our lives telling us that. Like, we could go back to the basics that people could just build themselves a home. Oh my gosh. <gasps> right? Or plant whatever plants they want. I mean, there's unlimited water in the earth. You guys could go and drill for it, so you don't have to worry about drought resistant. Because you can flood the land with this water, and it waters it. But you guys don't even want to look into that, because you just want to claim there's a drought. That's man-made. It's intentional. For you guys to do stuff like you're doing, have your hands in our lives and being like, here, let me puppeteer you and dictate what you do in your life. It's totally bullshit. Thank you. We will now hear from those that have requested to speak by phone. When it is your turn to speak, you'll be unmuted and you will hear a recording that will tell you to begin your comments after the beep. Again, I'd like to remind the callers they should meet their TV or live video stream before they begin speaking and we will begin with our first caller. To the caller, you can go ahead and state your name and begin your comments. We'll come back to this caller. Good morning, my name is John Bodarf with cleanearthforkids.org. Thank you for the Native Landscape Program. Uh, however, I did not see anything in the program documentation stopping the use of synthetic pesticides and synthetic fertilizers. Uh, pesticides are poison, that is their purpose, and they are designed and created to be toxic and lethal. 
There's a massive amount of data and studies showing the use of pesticides increases the risk of Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, asthma, lung disease and cancer, leukemia, lymphoma, autism, blood and nerve disorders, diabetes, birth defects, miscarriages, sterility, depression, anxiety, ADD and ADHD, and many other diseases and health conditions. Synthetic pesticides and fertilizers run off into our water, harm us, and our environment. They are found in our streams and drinking water and in our air and the ground our kids play on. These poisons are a direct threat to human health, biodiversity, and our climate. Legal is not safe. Uh, the U.S. only bans 21 pesticides. China bans 54, and the EU bans 195. They're all our safe alternatives. Uh, please include a non-toxic integrated pest management program that does not have synthetic pesticides or fertilizer into the native landscape plan. Educate the public on the dangers of pesticides and the many safe, natural, and effective alternatives. We use a massive amount of pesticides in San Diego. Cal EPA data shows over 53,000 pounds of pesticides per square mile in the county from 2012 to 2014. Protect our own health. Uh, along with native plants and biodiversity, we must quickly wet, move away from using synthetic pesticides and fertilizers. There's a lot of other alternatives out there. We need to quickly transition our farmers and, and homeowners away from using uh, synthetic pesticides and fertilizers. They are poison. And don't forget that they are petrochemicals, so they all come from fossil fuels. So that 53,000 pounds per square mile, that all comes from fossil fuels. So to protect our, our native plants, our biodiversity, our human health, our animals. Thank you. Your must... time is up. We'll go to the next caller. Hello, my name is Anne-Marie Benz. I'm the Horticulture Programs Manager for California Native Plant Society. Thank you to the Board of Supervisors and staff for putting forth a comprehensive uh, native plant landscaping ordinance. We obviously support its passage. Native plants are not only a beautiful option, San Diego County is a biodiversity hotspot with a beautiful landscape and beautiful options for this. They're also one of the best choices for clean air, clean water, biodiversity, reducing um, water use in the landscape, reducing chemicals in the landscapes because they reduce the need for some of the same maintenance that you'd have with a traditional landscape. And in general, they are supported by the public. There's a recent UC Davis study showing that over 80% of the public strongly supports native plant landscaping in public spaces. And we're excited to see San Diego County move forward as a leader in in institutionalizing this piece. We like the staged um, framework and phasing in the implementation and want to offer that some of the resources already exist and could be brought online sooner by adapting them to the local needs, specifically things like the garden planners, landscaper training, and other resources that are available through us and other partners. Thank you for considering doing this, and we appreciate all the thought that you've put into it. Thank you. We'll go to the next caller. Hello, this is Mary Matava, and thank you very much, Chair Fletcher and Supervisors, for the opportunity to speak in front of you today. As President of San Diego County Farm Bureau, I would like to thank staff for their outreach to our group and other stakeholders. San Diego County Farm Bureau supports the educational and incentive-based approach to the Native Plant Policy Options Program. However, the knowledge base for production and use of natives is limited, and in many cases, these plants are very hard to establish on disturbed terrain. Our growers lead the nation in nursery production and that know that in order for this project to be scalable and successful, a lot of work needs to be done to increase this knowledge base. We would like the Board of Supervisors to consider funding a native plant specialist position in UC Cooperative Extension for San Diego County to work with nurseries, landscapers, and to provide workshops for homeowners to ensure the success of this program. 
Again, many thanks to staff for their hard work on this important item before you today. Thank you. We'll go to the next caller. Hi. Good morning, Supervisors. My name is Frank Landis, and I'm a co-chair of the Biodiversity Working Group representing the San Diego chapter of the California Native Plant Society. Of course, I urge you to support this program. The San Diego chapter of CNPS is committed to helping it succeed. And I want to note that Anne Marie Benz actually represents the entire state organization. So the entire organization of CNPS, which, has, which is a binational NGO, is committed to helping us proceed, to succeed. And we're very happy to continue working with the board, the board and the county to that end. I want to thank Supervisor Fletcher, Supervisor Lawson Reamer, uh, her staffer Cody Pedersen, Kelly Bray, Megan Kelly, and all the county staff who've worked on this. We've got a long way to go, and hopefully it will be a very rewarding journey. Thank you very much for taking my comments. Thank you. We'll go to the next caller. Hey, this is uh, Dr. Peter Anderson. I'm a volunteer officer of Sierra Club San Diego. And we want to commend the Board of Supervisors for um, putting this item on the agenda and for getting staff to uh, develop a fabulous comprehensive program uh, for native landscape uh, programs that we are fully in support of. Special thanks to Kelly Bray and Megan Kelly, who are uh, great staff members and have done a fabulous job in implementing the intent of the supervisors. Uh, we favor this because it's a way to uh, uh, increase fire prevention, a uh, way to reduce soil erosion, increase carbon absorption, uh, reduce water. And no, we can't just drill for water because the aquifer is dry. I want that on the record. And to preserve our ecosystems. Um, so uh, without further ado, I'm going to commend you uh, for your efforts on the Board of Supervisors and commend staff for their excellent efforts and uh, vote yes. Thank you. Thank you. We'll go to the next caller. Good morning. My name is Suzanne Hume. I'm the educational director and founder of CleanEarthForKids.org. And just a quick reminder, um, I started Clean Earth for Kids and left my job as a teacher because I was poisoned by pesticides. So this issue is really important. And just to say, I look forward to talking to Mel Megan Kelly and others. Clean Earth for Kids was not invited to participate in this, although we have been working on this for over five years. We've spoken at hundreds of meetings. Hopefully you've heard my voice and heard our message, and you know that you're welcome to join us at cleanearthforkids.org. Yes, we support this, but <laughs> you must stop using toxic synthetic pesticides. Our kids in San Diego County are sitting on toxic pesticides. Pesticides drift, I know. I chose not to sue the County of San Diego was that a mistake? I'm not sure at this point, because here we are again, five years later, excluded again. Adopt a real IPM that actually stops the use of toxic synthetic man-made pesticides used on our county parks and county lands and stop leasing to West Coast tomato growers 100 feet from where I was poisoned, where people live on three sides. Direct staff to use examples from the city of Malibu IPM and so many others that do not allow synthetic man-made pesticides. For your education, um, oh, just to say, the Farm Bureau was allowed, right, and invited. Cleaners for Kids was not. I need you to think about that. Okay, so I'm just going to regroup real quick. Uh, sorry, a little shaken by all of this. Um, so we must have educational programs to stop the harms of and, and let everyone know about the harms of synthetic man-made pesticides. Not just 
um, well, for example, glyphosate is linked to 17 different kinds of cancer, um, and that's currently being there are other. Thank you. Your time is up. We'll go to the next caller. Good morning. I'm Dr. Ronald Asplin, chair of the San Diego Sierra Club Conservation Committee. The Sierra Club strongly supports the San Diego County native plant landscaping proposal. Bioregionally specific plant recommendations, educational materials, a certification program, demonstration gardens, landscape retrofits of county facilities, and an equity-based incentive program will make San Diego a leader in habitat restoration and preservation. This is especially important due to San Diego County's amazing biodiversity and our wide range of microclimates. In addition to habitat preservation, benefits of the program include drought tolerance, climate resiliency, soil stabilization, air and water purification, and reduced habitat fragmentation. If adopted, we look forward to working with the county, and we urge the county that the native plant program be implemented without the use of toxic herbicides and pesticides. Thank you very much for all your work. Thank you. We'll go to the next caller. In truth, no awful fire, Sierra Club, but plenty of frivolous lawsuits to dig for. The effects of climate change, such as drought and extreme heat, that the side mentions have been horrible lately. I've got rain-soaked plants. I have to cover them every night because of the freezing temperatures. It's nuts. Helen's name is on this item, but it's obvious that Tara just lets you put your name on it because it reeks of the United Nations Agenda 21 plan. When it mentions plans such as wildlife corridors and habitats near suburban development. So good luck with developing a comprehensive native plant landscaping policy for both public and private property in the unincorporated area. Because of the climate change extreme heat, choose your plants wisely or they'll freeze to death, actually. This item continually mentions external stakeholders. Do we ever get a description of who exactly that is? Is it the Sierra Club? Are they benefiting from these plans? This San Diego County Native Landscape Program would support plans, programs, initiatives, and policies that push habitat and water conservation, such as the Climate Action Plan, the $5,000 County Tree Planning Program, the Regional Decarbonization Framework that de-incentivizes driving and promotes toxic lithium mining, and the Multiple Species Conservation Program, which allows endangered eagles to die from wind turbines. The proposed Phase 1 implementation will cost $297,000. The Phase 1 action to install demonstration gardens at county libraries will cost $95,000. But costs for Phase 2 and Phase 3 are unknown. These supervisors are waiting for federal Biden inflation debt dollars, I'm sure. But follow the rules and plant what they say, Audra. Thank you. Your time is up. We'll go to the next caller. Good morning, board. Kathleen Lippitt here. As a longtime advocate of protecting the environment, I want to thank the county and the staff and its staff for implementing this native landscape program and the environmental benefits that they, it will confer. With respect, these policy goals are incompatible, though, with the county's decision to allow unlimited hemp and marijuana growth in unincorporated areas. The expansion of hemp and marijuana and the ability to manage them successfully will be endlessly challenged by the growers who have no interest in the long-term sustainability or biodiversity of unincorporated lands. They will not be prevented from using the dangerous pesticides, insecticides, and herbicides, many of which have been banned in this country for years because there's no oversight. They will destroy native plants and insects. Their monocrop cultivation not only destroys native plants, populations, and insects, but also uses an inordinate amount of water. 
they're not restricted from using municipal municipal water, and so they drain the very precious resource of unincorporated residents up to well water. The Department of Agriculture is in charge of hemp permits, but since it is a complaint-driven process, the department has no way of knowing how many illegal hemp grows there are. The public has no ability to distinguish between a marijuana grow and a hemp grow. The phenology or timing of endemic plant species is essential to understanding their growth cycles. But they have evolved, evolved for hundreds and thousands of years. They're compatible with nearby flowering fruits and plants, bird migration, and endemic insects. That process is disrupted when endemic insects and plant species are replaced. Thank with you. Your time is up. And Chair Fletcher, with that, uh, concludes public comment on this item. Thank you. We have a uh, motion by myself, seconded by Supervisor Lawson Reamer. Again, I'm very grateful to everyone who worked so hard uh, to get the policy to this point and look forward to seeing it moving forward. We'll go before we vote, let's go to Vice Chair Vargas. Thank you, Chair, and uh, thank you for all the great work. I'll just keep it really quickly. Uh, for item number two, is there a way that the certification no. program? No, no, no. We're, we're, we're on item 11. Oh. Yeah, item 11. Okay. So, uh, oh, number two on item 11. Yes. yes. Got it. I got so, you. Item 11, there is, uh, is there a way that the certification program is operational sooner rather than leaving it all the way to the end of phase three, which is in 2028? Vice Chair, yes. We could act absolutely look at accelerating that portion of the, of the um, program. I think um, the piece that we need to really consider is sort of finding the partnerships that we need to operate um, and administer those programs. So that's something we could move forward in advance if you'd like. Okay. If that would be Good. Thank you. Outstanding. All right. We have a uh, motion by myself, second by Supervisor Austin Rimmer. Please vote. Thank you. And Chair Fletcher, that motion passes unanimously with all supervisors who are present voting aye. We're going to go back and take up our uh, formation of our consent calendar. Members of the public will have the opportunity to comment on consent uh, after uh, any supervisors have had the chance to remove any items that they wish uh, moved to discussion. Uh, after we do consent, we'll take a, a brief uh, short break to reset for our housing uh, conference. Uh, but let's begin with our uh, consent calendar. I'll start with Supervisor Anderson. If there's any items you wish to be pulled or remarks that you wish to make. Uh, not time, All right. Supervisor Lawson Neumer. Sorry, I'm taking a quick look. Is eight still on consent? Great. Yes. Um, okay, I just want to say this is great. I'm so excited. I go hiking down there a lot, and uh, this is so, so needed. So thank you. All right. Vice Chair Vargas. Yes, thank you, Chair. And I'll just, uh, I know that folks have been waiting that want to talk to some of these items, but um, I just want to say, the, uh, Ask my colleagues to support item number eight because I think this is an item that's very important to me. I, we have an opportunity this morning to really uh, invite the creation of a regional park project uh, that recognizes the potential not only of our South, South County uh, community but also of our national community. And it really is an opportunity for us to really highlight our youth and adult sports, including our equestrian work in that area. Uh, some of you may or may not know, and you've heard me talk about this before on the dais, that uh, for years, kids in that particular community who have been playing, who are part of the, uh, play baseball for the Southwest Little League, uh, would have to go to the nearest gas station to use quality bathrooms, right? And uh, many of the parents came to me and chatted with me, and you'll hear from some of them today, but uh, additionally to that, um, some other folks came to me and said, you know, we need to really elevate the need for investing in this area and, and investing in an area where our families really deserve to have recreational spaces. So this is a vacant 64-acre lot that has been set aside for years um, in the Tijuana River Valley Par uh, River Park. And uh, I think this is a, a great opportunity for us to really prioritize uh, and invite the creation of a regional park project that recognizes the potential of this region and it creates space that uh, is much needed in the area and really will, I think, expand uh, recreational facilities uh, that we've been looking at for many years. And so I think that we have an opportunity to bring a regional world-class active recreational site and community space that's, gonna, that's been long overdue and that is much needed. And also it provides an opportunity for 
all San Diegans to see the beauty of South County and, um, and who we are. And so um, I respectfully ask for everyone's support on this item. Thank you. Thank you, Vice Chair. Uh, I have no items to pull. I want to make uh, brief comments on item five, Heritage Park. I appreciate our parks team uh, tremendously for all the work, including the, the multi-year effort that's been underway surrounding Heritage Park. Uh, it is unique uh, in our uh, public parks portfolio. Uh, nowhere else in town do you have the city's first synagogue, Temple Beth Israel, uh, restored Victorian homes that demonstrate what, what San Diego looked like at a, at a point during our history. Uh, the preservation of these homes are a part of our shared history. They include the Edward and Wilkerson Bushy Head, who marched in the Trail of Tears, uh, William Sherman, a Civil War hero. There's uh, not just the, the Victorian homes that serve as accommodations for visitors, uh, but some really incredible outdoor space uh, right there in a central part of San Diego and in the Old Town area. Folks can have picnics, we can have small gatherings and events. And so the efforts moving forward on Heritage Park to renovate, restore, and really open up uh, these homes for the public to enjoy for special events, for occasions, and for visitors here, uh, I think is a really great way for us to activate more public space and bring more folks here. And so pleased to see that moving forward. And really want to commend Vice Chair Vargas for the actions on item eight, uh, really transforming the, the opportunities down there to create something that would be a lasting uh, uh, legacy, a moment for families to go out and enjoy. Um, I think is an incredible effort forward and a creative way to look at it. And so pleased to support all of these. Uh, with that, I'll make a motion to approve the items on consent. Is there a second? Second. Motion by myself, second by Vice Chair Vargas. Let's hear from our public speakers on consent. Thank you, Chair Fletcher. We have nine total requests to speak on items on the consent calendar, four individuals in person, and five requesting to speak by phone. For any members of the public that requested to speak on items on the consent calendar, please dial into the conference line now using the instructions that were provided to you. We will begin with the in-person speakers. As your name is called, if you could please come forward and stand against the east wall under the murals until it is your turn to speak. And I'd like to invite forward the following individuals. Uh, Sandra, Norma, Audra, and Robert. You'll have two minutes to address the board. And if you could please begin by stating your name for the audio record. Uh, good morning, Board of Supervisors. My name is Sandra Nunez Soria, uh, and I come here in support of item number eight, increasing regional recreational opportunities. Um, I come not only as a mom, um, but also as the treasurer of the nonprofit South, uh, South Bay Youth Lacrosse, a recreational league of lacrosse players in the South Bay, and also uh, as a childhood resident of Nestor, the community where this uh, project is uh, proposed. Um, I, uh, as a mom, a lacrosse mom, I travel throughout all of San Diego uh, participating in uh, tournaments and games. And um, we spend a lot of money in those communities buying lunch. And um, it would be really awesome to see uh, us spend some money in our community as well and bring additional revenue. Um, as uh, somebody that grew up in the area, I could say that um, um, more green space is so needed for our community. I grew up playing sports. There was one park in the area, none with an open field. Um, so it is. it would be amazing to have that in my uh, childhood community. Um, I want to thank uh, Vice Chair Nora Vargas for bringing this item um, forward and look forward to helping plan this amazing uh, multi-sport uh, facility for our youth. Thank you. Good morning, um, Chair and members of the board. My name is Norma Chavez-Peterson. I'm here today with my soccer mom hat of 21 years. I've raised daughters playing soccer. I've been pretty much a lifelong resident of South Bay and know firsthand the real gap that exists in our region in terms of access to green space. I'm a huge fan. Our family's a huge fan of all of our regional park spaces, and it's wonderful to see um, Vice Chair Nora Vargas bring this forth um, to really create something that's long lasting, that's gonna benefit not just um, our binational region, South Bay region, but our entire county, because there's really a need for more green spaces, more open fields for youth sports. Um, I'm also, I'm a mom at the Rebel Soccer Club, um, which has over 1,200 soccer players, mostly from South Bay, playing even and competing at the national level. And for the most part, especially during COVID, we've had to drive all the way to Hamul, 
all the way to Claremont just to practice because there's not enough fields in South Bay for our children to practice at. So I'm really looking forward to this project. Um, encourage all of you to support it and look forward to participating as part of the community input to design something that's beautiful for all of our families and children to enjoy. Thank you very much. And since I'm here and I have 30 seconds left, I always also want to thank um, Chair Fletcher for your leadership as chair. It's been a challenging couple of years, especially with COVID. So I commend you for your leadership. Thank you, everyone. I have a slideshow. My name is Robert. Tell me when, well, can we, can we get a break on the time here? Thanks, appreciate that. Uh, this is agenda item four. I'm changing a little bit here because I really disagree with this being on the consent calendar. You have a, uh, article here or an item here that's for $8 million for one general aviation airport called Gillespie Field. That's the largest grant that they've ever applied for. Everything else has been four and five. And with the FAA reauthorization uh, bill coming up in two months and the EPA has filed a petition for banning leaded avgas, this is an important topic. There are several questions, click, I mean this, this, I had a presentation because I thought we were going to take aviation serious in San Diego. We voted for a new council. We got a new council. This is the status quo. This is why Gillespie has prospered for 40 years and poisoning our family and taking up our land and our infrastructure money. Sandag has poured bit, millions into stuff around Gillespie. Millions. And yet we're just going to rubber stamp it like the old crew. Okay. And here's one of the problems. Can we go back, please? In the last rehabilitation of the runways, they increased the runway length 706 feet, which changed the pattern all around East County. Next slide, please. They are the, un, the, the worst, how can I say this? They are the unsafest airport in California with 57 fatalities. And those are the 10 airports at the FEA. Read the whole letter that I, I submitted for your source document. Next. This is the airport. Now, this is the layout. So I wanted it entered into the record. So when they get done, it doesn't change. Because if it changes, it should be under CEQA. Next slide. And this is why they're doing it now during Christmas time with the two federal agencies petitioning them and having a drastic impact is that Grant money is the biggest Thank you. Your time motivator up. for sealing Thank you. an aircraft, Thank an you. airport. This is, Thank it you. should be, Thank I know, but I'm you. kind of. Thank you, Robert. Your time's up. Next speaker. Mr. Gurman, your continued outburst of violating the rules of procedure. Please take a seat and allow the meeting to continue. To your first warning, please sit down. Next speaker. Next speaker. Start your time. My time just, you're such a, oh my gosh, you're so evil, it's crazy, holy shit. I mean, you just don't care about anybody but yourself. Um, <laughs> poor guy. Uh, yeah, wow, so you want to, um, I can't even think now. Um, uh, man, my brain just stopped working. Um, advanced treatment technologies to treat flows to drinking water standards from potable water to drinking water. And you're even like, people are drinking sewer water because of things. So it's like, I've told you, there's unlimited water in the earth. We don't need to be drinking reused water and giving that to people. It's ridiculous that that's even happening. And um, I mean, you talk about the urban runoff, but you want to spray fire retardant across the, like miles, t tens of 20 miles along the road that's permanent or whatever. That goes into the water, it's totally toxic. It's toxic to the plant, so it's like, I don't understand how on one hand you can be like, we need to save the environment while we're destroying it. Um, let's see. And then, you know, like number six, you're just, you keep exempting certain things from CEQA and other things don't get that exemption and they don't get to be put through. So I don't, I don't understand, that's not equitable at all. It isn't, it really isn't. I mean, if you, it doesn't make any sense. Um, and then number seven, this started in 1989. It's been 33 years. <laughs> but I mean, imagine having 165 homes built 
at some point. I mean, are we just gonna keep waiting and being like, you know what? It's gonna take another 30 years, but we're gonna do it, I promise. And like, why was the land vacant in T on, at, by the TJ River? And is that land gonna be tested to see if it's toxic before you build on it? Yeah? You are? Thank you, your time's up. We will now hear from those that requested to speak by phone. When it is your turn to speak, you will be unmuted and you'll hear a recording that will begin your, uh, tell you to begin your comments after the beep. Again, I'd like to remind the callers that they should mute their TV or live video stream before they begin speaking. And we will begin with our first caller. Hinton, um, happy holidays. Uh, I want to say I agree with Oliver Twist that um, that uh, the departure of Helen represents a loss of the stabilizing influence, and I'm sorry to say her leave. Um, then. Uh, I also want to say the consent calendar contains a number of silly items again, uh, such as waving sequa. Uh, so, um, I mean, I think serious considerations should be taken uh, to the placement and necessity and the number of people who want to comment on the next calendar. Thanks for your attention. Resign, Nathan, resign. Thank you. We'll go to our next caller. Truth. Item one is more dangerous, always stop signs in La Presa, San Marcos, and Valley Center. Under the county's local roadway safety plan, they're slowly implementing smart cities and connected vehicles. Item two is the complete streets policy to make it frustrating to drive with obstacles such as slower driving speeds and more bike lanes. Item three is the Los Coches low flow urban runoff diversion to sewer project in Lakeside with a baffle box for about $1.4 million. Is that like the item on April 27th where the ground just captures water and you supervisors capture $2 million for that fraud? In 2025, a portion of the county's wastewater will be directed to the East County Advanced Water Purification Project for drinking water, inverted crap into wine. Item four, it's admitted that Gillespie Field provides fire response and transportation, yet you supervisors have no problem increasing the lease prices every year and working on a sustainable airport plan to cut out jobs and flights. The project will cost about $8.4 million. Item five, I love Old Town, but this plan to turn old heritage park homes into hotels could be better economically planned. The estimated gross revenue isn't seen until year four, in which the revenue would be less than $25,000 for a four-year investment of over $18.6 million in annual operating costs and initial project costs. Is that worth it? Item seven, 165 single family homes in Bonsall approved in 1993, currently vacant and in the first phase of development. Why? Item eight, the Tijuana River Valley Regional Park is already 1,800 acres, but land monopolists here want another 64 acres. The excuse, nature gap. I sense gaps in common sense. No to everything in the consent as usual. Thank, thank you. And Chair Fletcher, that concludes public comment on the, on the items on the consent calendar. We have a motion by myself, seconded by Vice Chair Vargas to approve the consent calendar. Please vote. And Chair Fletcher, that motion passes unanimously with all supervisors who are present voting aye. We have a time certain item, uh, item 30 for 11 a.m. Uh, we will go ahead and resume non-agendized public communication uh, at this time uh, to get us to the 11 a.m. hour. Thank you, Chair Fletcher. We have 10 total requests remaining to speak, uh, re remaining for requests to speak on matters not listed on the agenda, and those are all coming via phone. 
So for those that have requested to speak via phone, if you could please dial into the conference line now using the instructions that were provided to you, and we will give you a moment to do so. Now we will hear from those that have requested to speak by phone. Again, when it is your turn to speak, you will be unmuted and you will hear a recording that will tell you to begin your comments after the beep. Again, I'd like to remind the callers that they should mute their TV or live video stream before they begin speaking. And we'll begin with our first caller. Again, if you could please state your name before beginning your comments. Hi, good morning, Board of Supervisors. Mark Wilcox here, and I want to say I strongly support Barbara Gordon's earlier comments. I'm the father of young adult children and grandparent to teenage children. As a person who cares about the good health of my family and others, I called in today regarding the recent Wall Street Journal editorial entitled The Progressive Paradox on Marijuana. Tobacco bad, vaping bad, marijuana good, for some strange reason. The editorial reports on the study published last week in the journal Radiology that finds that marijuana smokers had even higher rates than tobacco smokers of emphysema, airway inflammation, and of course, the, than non-smokers. Over 3 million people in the United States have been diagnosed with emphysema. Emphysema is one of the most preventable respiratory illnesses because it is so strongly linked to smoking. Emphysema is recognizable by its shortness of breath and coughing, especially during exercise or physical exertion. This continues to get worse until breathing is difficult all the time. Are you still there? We'll, we'll come back to you if, if you're still there. No. We will go to our next public commenter. Thank you. Good morning, Chair Fletcher and Board of Supervisors. My name is Becky Rapp. Um, as a parent and a youth group mentor, I wanted to thank you for providing the gun violence listening sessions. I was forced fortunate to attend the session that was held in San Marcos at One Safe Place. We had a great discussion regarding gun violence as a whole, focusing on the root of the problem. The overwhelming consensus of those in attendance was the fact that poor mental health can lead to violent behavior, all kinds of violent behavior. In order to really combat violence, we need to focus on mental health, especially with our youth. The North County Gang Commissioner stated, a solution to gun violence is helping our youth, providing mental health treatment and drug prevention. An ER nurse was in attendance and stated that in her Escondido hospital, they've seen a dramatic increase in the trauma center over the past five years. Mental health holds make up half of the patients in the ER. The majority of those patients are on drugs and alcohol, primarily meth, and high-potency THC products. I thought it interesting that from her firsthand experience, she was describing meth and high-potency THC as having the same level of severity and negative impacts on patients. This observation should be frightening as meth is classified as a highly potent illegal drug. If we're measuring the negative impacts of high-potency THC products to methamphetamine, then I would hope this board would consider slowing down with the marijuana ordinance and increase your focus on education and prevention of these highly addictive drugs, especially the negative impact they're having on our young people and their mental health. Thank you. Thank you, and we'll go to the next caller. It's truth. Guess what? It's time for everyone's end of year evaluation. Here we go. 
Multiple hats, Jim actually listened, but fell completely at trying to play the good guy. He knows it's all BS and says he doesn't want to usurp local government, but he'll still vote it all in. Helen listened, but still signed off on every bad thing. Andrew, the younger brother of David Hall, was professional right up until he kept taking orders from Nathan to cut our call. It's called a hot mic, you fool. Sarah was calm and collected. Good job. Hopefully you'll be better than Helen at ethical decision-making. I'm doubtful, though. Ryan has had a super boring voice. Hopefully he'll keep trying to not accidentally cut speakers off. Free money, Joel. Only for printers and money trees does his neck move from texting. Other than that, he's always neutral or silent. Ice cold cow butt Tara used her daughter as a pawn, a stratagem. While she never once paid attention to any speaker, Tara also evilly tried to limit the public speaking time to 30 seconds. Well, I'd love your mic to have the volume permanently turned down, Tara, like nails on a chalkboard, especially when you misrepresent the Bible. Not on my effing watch, Nora. Start studying more languages so you can get to superhero Saiyan level 9,000 one day like me. <laughs> Nathan was easily jarred, transparent with strings on his shoulders, and was a hothead desperate to censor free speech. Lastly... I heard you on the hot mic yesterday, Nora. Referring to Audrey, you said something's wrong with her when she was describing how Sheriff Gonzalez is a threat to the community. You failed at leadership last year and this year, Nora. And I'm afraid even with your NACO training, you're going to fail again. I wish you luck. You're seriously going to need Thank you. We'll go to our next caller. Good morning, Kathleen Lippitt here. Those of us who have studied public health policy and research were taught that sound public policies had to be evaluated using a research approach that would be beneficial, but would also not result in unintended paradoxical effects. A superficial approach is one that seems reasonable, allocating money, creating a task force, um, describing it as a, an epidemic or creating an entire bureaucracy to deal with the issue. Of primary importance, though, is knowing where along the behavioral continuum to intervene with a public health policy to address and mitigate the problem effectively, where it will have the greatest impact, and where it will be the least expensive. Delaying until the final stage of addiction is to waste taxpayer health care dollars. But worse, it allows the problem and the harms to continue. I'd like to share a new study by the American Medical Association which recognized that the only marijuana reform that was ever needed was decriminalization. There was no need to add a legal sales component and in fact adding that has been the bane of local municipalities who have attempted without success to regulate an industry that is not amenable to becoming to being regulated. Decriminalizing possession without adding that legal component would have accomplished the goal that legalizers, legalizers always claim that they wanted. No more arrests and no more incarceration, although that was hyperbole on their part because people weren't arrested for simple possession ever. Thank you very much for letting me speak. Thank you. We'll go to the next caller. Um, Paul Hinken, happy holidays again. Um, I'm calling in about uh, guns and violence stuff. Um, the guns and violence problem is not easily solved, but um, one thing you can do, uh, supervisors, is look in the mirror and, uh, you know, I really wonder how many of your policies and procedures are actually hurting things, are actually making the guns and violence problem worse. 
things like um, overcrowding people in the apartment, which produces stress. And, um, you know, when you can hear your neighbors talking and discussing and shouting and all those things, I mean, that uh, raises the potential for um, conflict. And um, also uh, things like the sheriff not not having an effective de-escalation policy, um, all these new hires coming in or not, without I turn over. sufficient they can't training. Keep anybody. And uh, <clears throat> I mean things like uh, taking away or um, taking away the non-drug use policy in the apartments. That's that's asinine. Uh, so, I mean, you really got to think about what you're doing. Resign, Nathan. Resign, sucker. Thank you. We'll go to the next caller. Good morning, Board of Supervisors. Mr. 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 Wilcox, we're going to go ahead and resume your time. You have one minute left. Okay. Uh, don't know where I was cut off, but uh, let me try here. Uh, okay, about emphysema. It's recognizable by shortness of breath and continues to get worse and worse uh, because most patients aren't di diagnosed till stage two or three. So where might people have gotten the idea that smoking or vaping marijuana is safe? It's remarkable how politicians have tried to fit in with the cultural cool kids by enabling marijuana storefronts in our county. Our good health should not become politicized, but supported by sound policies that do not include promoting tobacco or marijuana use or sale of their products. And I want to say I strongly support Barbara Gordon's earlier comments and also recently Paul. He made a lot of sense. Thank you. Thank you. And Chair Fletcher, that concludes requests for non-agenda public communication this morning. All right, uh, that concludes everything we have other than item 30, uh, which is time certain. We're going to give staff an opportunity to uh, reset and get prepared for that. So we will begin the housing item at 11.15. 11.15, we will reconvene as a board. Uh, and that'll be our final agenda item for today.
We will reconvene our board meeting and we will take up item 30, housing workshop. I will turn it over to CAO and staff for their presentation. Chair Flepper, Chair Flepper, <laughs> Chair Flepper, your very last board meeting. I'm gonna mess that up. Uh, yes, that's right, as chair. Chair Fletcher, members of the board, uh, almost good afternoon. Over the past two years, your board has been tireless in your efforts to address the most challenging issues our region faces. You adopted a strategic framework for the future that sets the tone from the top, establishing core values of equity, sustainability, community engagement, transparency, and data-driven evaluation to drive decision-making. And you have spotlighted critical issues to rally resources and foster urgent action to implement programs that address behavioral health needs, public health inequities, justice reform, homeless services, climate change, and so much more. Today's call for an affordable housing workshop is a further extension of your ongoing bold efforts to make substantial positive change in our region. <clears throat> With population growth outpacing housing production, the average cost of purchasing a home skyrocketing, and substantial rent increases, more and more residents are facing housing insecurity. These truths spawn an additional reality that in individuals and families who are unable to afford housing have a higher probability of falling into another crisis, homelessness. Your board has brought forward more than 20 board letters to begin addressing various aspects of the housing crisis. Some are policy related, some are resource related, others are specific to land use regulations, while others are directly related to excess county property and specific housing projects or programs to help people remain in their homes. Seeing the need to have a comprehensive approach and holistic strategy to address housing needs, you task staff to bring forward those directives in a workshop to help determine priorities and timelines for achieving those directives, as well as informing policy, project, and resource decisions going forward. In order to facilitate a robust discussion, we have attempted to distill the desires of each board office into a document that seeks to address the priorities of this board, translates those priorities into objectives, and identifies specific strategies to achieve those objectives in the fastest but most realistic and comprehensive manner, while keeping your core values at the forefront of our pursuit. In some cases, these priorities have tension points. <clears throat> For example, where does building housing in the unincorporated area versus incorporated cities fall on the production and resource allocation spectrum, particularly as they relate to achieving arena capacity and usage of county surplus property? How should we balance our core county responsibilities for low income and very low income housing with the larger regional need for middle income and workforce housing? Seniors are falling into homelessness at the highest rate of all populations in the county. Should we prioritize housing for seniors over other vulnerable populations? How do we balance the need for housing, meeting our arena targets, and the very real need to tackle the climate crisis? We're developing a climate action plan, a regional decarbonization plan, a sustainable land use framework, and implementing a transportation study guide, and we'll have an update on the parcel by parcel analysis next year. Where geographically within the county does it make sense to focus our housing efforts, recognizing the need to address issues such as wildfire and reduce GHG emissions? And how do we balance that with equity and speed of delivering of new housing units? These are just a few of the tension points. We also have to ensure equitable access to housing across the entire region. How does new housing stack up against resources for preservation and rental assistance to keep people in housing? And we always have general fund pressures as various core county functions unrelated to housing compete for fiscal priority. Should we carve out an ongoing funding stream of general purpose revenue to generate an ongoing pipeline for housing while we pursue other creative funding alternatives? How do we think differently to identify new creative funding sources specific to housing? By outlining, by outlining these pressure points, it's not to build a discussion toward a binary decision model. This is not an either or zero sum exercise. We have to do it all, but we have to have a comprehensive approach that balances your core values and provides clarity for staff as we move forward to implement your direction. To help organize today's workshop, <clears throat> staff has developed an initial blueprint to tee up those discussions, and it's just that, an initial blueprint. This is for staff. This is sure to change as a result of this discussion today. And I expect it will change again as we move forward on our commitment to conducting robust stakeholder engagement. 
but we needed to have an initial document to start. I also believe that this presentation will help provide an overview of the many things that the county is implementing, including our housing element, BMT mitigation, and more. I want to remind everyone, though, that timelines are short. 2030 will be here before you know it, and it takes three to five years to bring units online. Funding streams open up again in January for us to pursue with the state, and we'll be putting the FY23-24 budget together in February and March. So we need to keep moving with a sense of urgency simultaneously as we work to build out the blueprint. Today's presentation will address the current 20 board letters. A status summary has been included in attachment C of the board letter. We also will show you how these fit into the eight-year timeline to 2030. You will see how many of these board letters, several of which are nearing completion, provide the foundation necessary to meet some of the housing crisis challenges. The board letter also tees up several recommendations which need to be addressed and possibly amended after the discussion. Therefore, we won't go through them until the board discussion and public speakers have weighed in. But I do want to point out recommendation five. This housing crisis is significant and we need additional expertise to help us if we are going to be successful. Housing has various elements that reach out across the enterprise, housing and community development, general services, real property, the sustainability office, planning and development services, finance, just to name a few. For us to be successful, we need outside expertise that will inform a holistic enterprise approach. The consultant will analyze our organization and make recommendations on creating an office of housing strategy. They will provide national best practices and innovative housing concepts to incorporate into our housing blueprint. <laughs> and they will play an instrumental role in our comprehensive community outreach. Before I turn the mic over to Michael Vu and our housing experts, I want to take a moment to recognize the team. This was not an easy task, and they all have worked long nights and weekends for the last several months, in addition to all their normal responsibilities to synthesize countless ideas, opinions, and directions into a thoughtful way to enable productive discussion that provides a path forward. It's not perfect. It's a work in progress, but this team has done extraordinary work to get it this far. I want to thank each and every one of you, and I know we all look forward to your discussion and future directions. With that, let me turn it over to Michael Boo. Thank you, Helen. Board members, let's go straight to the heart of today's workshop by covering the topics that will be presented today. As Helen conveyed the core values you outlined, you will see these values threaded through everything we are going to talk about today led by the more than 20 adopted board letters, which creates the foundation by which we have formulated an initial blueprint to begin deliberation. You will see that the overarching goal, objectives, and balancing of priorities considers our most vulnerable populations, ensures that county resources are prioritized equitably, and our decisions and actions are sustainable. Let's look at the agenda for today's workshop. First, I will be going over the regional landscape of the housing market crisis. Then, David Estrella, Marco Medved, and Davia Lynch, the Directors of Housing and Community Development, Department of General Services, and Planning and Development Services, will discuss the county's role in housing. I will provide an overview of the actions this board has taken in the, into, in the housing space, and then wrap up our presentation by moving into an opportunity for the board to have discussion related to all the materials we will present today. Going to the regional landscape of the housing crisis, let's take a look at what has been going on with our population in the region compared to the number of housing units being produced. You can see that our population has grown significantly since 1950, from a little over 500,000 people to approximately 3.3 million people in 2019. This contrasts with our housing units. In 1950, our housing units were in the 250,000 range. By 2019, our regional housing units grew to approximately one and a quarter million. We can see here that housing supply has not grown at nearly the rate that our population has grown. This is just one factor that could be contributing to the housing crisis, but it is not operating in a silo. Taking a look at the California and San Diego median home prices, you can see that home prices stayed relatively flat through the early and mid 1990s. In the late 90s to early 2000s, home prices increased, peaking in June 2007 at $619,000 in the San Diego region. Following the Great Recession, home prices again increased dramatically. And though you see a slight dip in the home prices toward the end of the chart, that does not mean that homes have become more affordable and accessible. 
I think we all know that. In fact, they are still more expensive than they ever have been. Now this chart, this may look familiar to you. As we discussed this yesterday, as the Federal Reserve is monitoring inflation, it has hiked up the effective federal funds rate to try to control prices. As the Fed funds rate rises, interest rates rise as well, including mortgage rates will follow. In November, the 30-year fixed mortgage rate increased to 7%. In addition to the increase in costs for a home, the increase in interest rates is having an impact on the affordability of homes. So while we have seen a slight decrease in home prices during the last half of 2022 due to the increasing interest rates, without a larger housing market correction, our region will continue to see a housing crisis as home ownership opportunities become less feasible and rents continue to rise. So what does affordability actually look like in our communities? Right now, the median home price in the region is $893,508. With this price, a household needs to make $268,052 annually in order to not be cost burden and be able to save and purchase a home. The realities, however, show that the current median household income sits at $106,900. Without being cost burdened, this income could afford a $320,700 home. This is a fairly large crevasse between these two realities and has the potential to widen without significant intervention on multiple fronts. Let's look at what is happening in the region when it comes to cost burden households. Over 40% of households across the region are feeling the pressures of rising housing costs. This is across both renters and homeowners. When it comes to housing, households are considered cost burden when they are using more than 30% of their annual income to pay for housing costs. Based on the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development planning data, 19.5% of households in the region are paying more than 50% of their annual income on housing. In addition, about 21.7% are spending between 30% and 50%. When housing is taking so much of a household's income, there is a higher probability that their struggles may lend itself to other social issues, including experiencing homelessness for the first time. The Regional Task Force on Homelessness shows that while 11,861 people who were experiencing homelessness were housed between October 2021 and September 2022, 15,327 experienced homelessness for the first time, a negative trend that desperately needs to be reversed. This is not to say that all of these individuals were unsheltered. Some may have moved in with family members or their personal support systems, but that is not always the case. Some individuals may have become unsheltered or relied on the county to provide other op housing options and services. Helen mentioned this about our senior population. Let's look at the 2022 point in time count data about who was experiencing homelessness and was unsheltered. 4,106 people were identified during the county as experiencing homelessness and were unsheltered. 25% of those unsheltered individuals were 55 years or old or older. And 47% 47 of those older than 55 were experiencing homelessness for the first time. Though the housing crisis is impacting many across the region, this is what we, have seen, what we have seen as our most vulnerable population to being priced out of housing and ending up unsheltered. So let's turn our attention to how this happens. When we look at housing availability and affordability is structured, we can see a spectrum of various housing types. The housing spectrum can be broken down into four primary categories emergency housing, transitional housing, affordable housing, and market rate housing. Emergency housing and transitional housing on the left is typically heavily subsidized by federal, state, and local sources. As we move through the spectrum to affordable housing, there is still a necessity for government funding, but the level of funding and services necessary is less than in emergency or transitional housing. Finally, on the right is market rate housing. This is the point in the spectrum where funding is fully reliant on the market with households being fully responsible for their own housing costs. This graphic depicts a movement to the right along the spectrum towards market rate housing. 
That is the county's goal. It is the region's goal. It is the state's goal. It is the country's goal to see folks move from needing emergency housing and transitional housing into affordable housing, building wealth that can last generations, and moving on to market rate housing. Affordable housing has been the county's primary focus. It is in this area the county is able to make the biggest impact leveraging other federal, state, and local funding sources to develop housing that allows people to exit homelessness and prevents others from experiencing homelessness. However, when affordable housing is not available, we can see what we refer to, to today as affordable regression, meaning rather than our community members having the opportunity to build wealth and move towards market rate housing, they could move left on the spectrum and have a need for transitional or emergency housing. They may even experience homelessness for the first time in their lives, making home ownership outside the grasp for many families for not just their generation, but future ones as well. To break this cycle, the county has taken a substantial role in identifying innovative approaches and also more traditional ways to combat the housing crisis. Let me take this opportunity to turn the presentation over to the other members of our county team to dig further into the county's role. David Estrella, Director of Housing and Community Development Services, take it away. Thank you, Michael, and good morning. As you saw, emergency housing is at the beginning of the housing spectrum. Emergency housing provides short-term shelter and services for persons who lack permanent housing options. This includes the chronically homeless, newly homeless, and domestic violence survivors. Transitional housing is often the next step for persons exiting emergency housing and includes services to help residents address barriers to permanent housing and prepare for future housing success. Transitional housing is short-term housing with a predetermined end date. You may see populations served here like foster youth, people experiencing homelessness, people in recovery from substance use disorders, people experiencing crisis, and domestic violence survivors. Affordable housing is housing that typically, through a deed restriction, is required to keep rent at a level that is affordable to the residents of the property, in most cases not above 30% of a household's income. Populations that are generally served in this affordable housing are very low income and low income individuals and families. People with special needs, low income seniors, transitional age foster youth, and people who may be seriously mentally ill. Market rate housing includes housing that is available for purchase or rent at the rate the market will bear. Populations you may see here are moderate income and above, people and families, as well as people at all states, at all states including students, families, seniors, and the workforce. Within each of these categories, there are various housing types or options. Emergency housing. Options here include shelters, hotels, safe parking and sleeping cabins. Emergency housing is generally fully subsidized by other funding sources. Transitional housing. Options include transitional housing programs and short-term subsidies. Affordable housing. This is the point in the housing spectrum where additional funding is needed to spur development. Types of affordable housing include permanent supportive housing, which pairs affordable rental housing with on-site services for residents who need additional support to thrive in permanent housing. Permanent affordable housing provides affordable housing for populations who do not generally need additional services or supports, however, cannot afford the cost of market rate housing. Mixed-use affordable housing combines affordable housing uh, units with non-subsidized commercial space at one development site. And then finally, market rate housing. This includes housing that results from the market and regulatory environment without any special subsidies or government assistance. Housing types within this category include mobile homes, accessory dwelling units, single-family detached units, and attached units like townhomes, as well as live-work units and multifamily apartments. Let's focus on affordable housing. The county is responsible for developing safe, healthy, and thriving communities through five primary affordable housing tools. First, the county administers programs funded through the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development, the state of California, as well as with local funds. These programs are primarily used to fund affordable housing development and include support 
for low-income homeowners and home buyers as part of the second tool. Third is various types of rental assistance. Over 11,000 households are assisted monthly through rental assistance programs such as the Housing Choice Voucher Program, which includes project-based vouchers. In addition to Housing Choice Vouchers, the county administers several other rental assistance programs, providing housing stability to vulnerable populations, such as veterans, people living with HIV AIDS, transition-aged foster youth, and persons with disabilities. Fourth, as your board is well aware, we leverage our county surplus property. This is just one of the many ways that we provide housing in the region and unincorporated areas. And lastly, the county also is responsible for zoning, permitting, and land use for the unincorporated areas. Davia will speak to this a little bit more in, in uh, just a few moments. Finally, with these five tools, we produce and preserve housing and prevent homelessness throughout the region as reflected in our HHSA frameworks to provide housing for vulnerable populations. For now, we'll pass the presentation to Marco to talk more about affordable housing on county-owned property. Marco. Thank you, David. Routinely, the county identifies land that is surplus to our needs and that may be leased or sold to non-county entities. The Surplus Lands Act requires publicly owned land to be first offered up as affordable housing. The aim of this act is to promote affordable housing development on unused or unutilized, underutilized public land through the state uh, to respond to exist the existing affordable housing crisis. The county-owned land falls under this program all qualifies as exempt surplus, meaning that it's been sold or leased for development of 100% affordable housing restricted to low or moderate income. When surplus county property is identified, first staff evaluates the site for housing uses. If this use is determined to be feasible, staff will request board approval of a surplus declaration and issuance of a request for proposal for affordable housing development. Through this process, an affordable housing developer is selected. Then there are various agreements that must be negotiated and, and agreed upon as part of the process, which also require additional board actions. Additionally, the county would handle the CEQA evaluation for the property and any demolition, if necessary, in order to make way for the affordable housing. Currently, eight projects on county-owned land are in various stages of development for 100% affordable homes. These projects are in pre-construction phases, except one which recently broke uh, ground in June. Once completed, the current affor uh, county affordable housing projects will result in over 1,400 affordable homes for low-income people. There are another handful of county excess properties being evaluated right now and are expected to be brought uh, to, the, to your board for consideration of surplus declaration in early 23. Sustainability guidelines or preferences may be considered for inclusion within county-issued NOFAs or RFPs related to development of affordable housing projects that receive funding from the county or are on our own county property. These will reduce the energy use and greenhouse gases over the long term. The preferences include building electrification to include ENERGY STAR electric appliances, infill development opportunities near job centers, existing and planned transit, and community services like park schools and childcare. Building certification in leadership in energy and environmental design or LEED to a silver certification or equivalent, which also exceeds state Title 24 energy efficiency standards. Low water, native landscaping, uh, demonstrating compliance with the county's landscape ordinance, and at least a 10% improvement on energy efficiency for developments undergoing rehabilitation. And now develop, uh, David will lead us through a broader look at all the funding strategies that we leverage at the county for affordable housing. Thanks, Marco. The county utilizes a variety of tools to incentivize or subsidize affordable housing development throughout the region. Project-based vouchers are a critical tool for developing permanent supportive housing and housing in the county housing authority jurisdiction for extremely low-income households. The county provides a monthly subsidy for each unit while the resident pays only 30% of their monthly income. State and federal entitlement funds, such as funding through the Home Investment Partnership Program or permanent local housing allocation programs, allow the county to invest in affordable housing in the unincorporated areas, as well as other specified incorporated areas dictated by the funding source. Repurposing county-owned land or acquiring land and making it available for affordable housing development is helping to reduce total development costs and increase the region's affordable housing stock. 
County-owned property is primarily located in incorporated areas. However, the acquisition of a parcel in Ramona will soon result in a senior development in the unincorporated area. Funding such as the Innovative Housing Trust Fund is invested in affordable housing developments across the region. The Innovative Housing Trust Fund, although now depleted, allowed true local discretion without many of the restrictions often imposed by federal or state regulations. And finally, the No Place Like Home program brought $130 million of funding to the county from the state for the development of affordable housing throughout the region for persons experiencing homelessness who also have a serious mental illness. These funds were made available over a four-year period. The fourth and final allocation was received in 2022. In addition to funding for the development of these units, the county committed to 20 years of behavioral health services for residents. Since 2017, the county has taken several bold actions to increase affordable housing options throughout the region. This slide shows the outcome of those efforts. The county invested $205 million and made eight excess county sites available for development for 3,990 affordable units in 45 developments across the region. The money invested by the county leveraged nearly $1.8 billion in other federal, state, local, and private sources. These units will remain affordable for between 55 and 99 years, and over that period, will be home to more than 41,000 San Diegans. Here you can see where these investments have been made and what our affordable housing pipeline looks like. In the unincorporated area of the county, four developments have been awarded funding from the county since 2017. One of these developments is complete. One is under construction, and two are in the pipeline finalizing pre-development activities. In the incorporated area, the picture looks significantly different. 41 developments have been awarded funding since 2017. 13 of those have completed construction and are occupied. 12 are currently under construction and an additional 16 are in the pipeline finalizing pre-development activities. It takes many years for developments to go from concept to completion. If we are not providing funding for affordable housing development on a consistent basis, the pipeline of housing will diminish, taking several years to build up again and begin to see the results of the county's efforts. As you will see on the next slide, the financing of affordable housing developments is anything but simple. The county plays a significant role in financing affordable housing development and preservation by providing long-term deferred loans at below market interest rates. We accomplish this by utilizing federal, state, and local funding sources that are administered by the county and by providing excess land and project-based vouchers. In addition to funding provided by the county, developers must secure funding from various other sources. Typically, a developer will seek funding through competitive federal and or state programs, some of which are listed on this slide. In addition to these funds, developers secure financings through other local and philanthropic agencies, as well as private lending institutions. The complexity of affordable housing finance is a key contributing factor to the time it takes for development to come to fruition. On average, it takes four to six years for developers to acquire a property, secure all funding sources, and complete construction. On this slide, you see the financing package for an upcoming affordable housing development on county excess property. This development will create 64 units of low-income housing for seniors in the downtown area. The development cost is $45 million, or $690,000 per unit. If you've ever purchased a home, you know the time and effort it takes to secure financing through just one bank. Imagine having to secure financing through eight different sources, several of which are competitive with application cycles, opening only once or twice a year. If a development is not successful with the first application, depending on the source, it can be six to 12 months before a developer can apply again. 
The average per unit cost for county of funded affordable housing developments over the past five years is $495,000. One of the most critical sources of affordable housing finance is tax credits. State tax credits typically account for 40% or more of an affordable housing development's total financing package. The county's average investment over the last five years is just over $51,000 per unit. With this information, we can conclude that in order to meet our regional housing goal of 10,000 units by 2030, the total cost from all sources will be nearly $5 billion. The total tax credits required will exceed $2 billion. And if all units were funded by the county, more than $500 million is needed. In order to meet just our RENA goal of roughly 2,800 very low and low income units, it will require $1.4 billion in total funding. 560 million from tax credits and 145 million from the county. Tax credits are an extremely competitive funding source with a total of $550 million made available in 2021 across the entire state of California. Since 2017, about 8.5% of total tax credits available have been awarded to the San Diego region. Earlier, I mentioned that the complex financing of affordable housing is one of the key factors that contributes to the time it takes to build. In addition to being extremely competitive, the timing of tax credits funding cycles, state funding cycles, and local funding availability makes it even more challenging to fit all the puzzle pieces together. 9% tax credit applications are accepted twice a year in April and August. 4% tax credit applications are accepted three times a year in February, May, and September. If a developer is not successful in securing 9% tax credits with the first application, they must wait until the next application cycle, which is up to seven months away from that. Additionally, in 2022, the state of California combined, combined application for four multifamily housing programs into one supernova that will be made available only once a year. Locally, funds are made available on different schedules. Sometimes, some jurisdictions have annual dedicated funding streams that allow them to release notices of funding availability at a scheduled time each year, while other jurisdictions, like the county, do not necessarily know when funding will be available and therefore release NOFAs on an unscheduled timeline. Uncertainty on if or when a local jurisdiction will be releasing a NOFA makes it challenging for a developer to invest in the upfront work and money it takes to have a proposal ready to submit to the local jurisdiction, the state, and ultimately tax credits. All of these considerations tell the story of why it takes up to six years to develop affordable housing. If funding is not available for the county to release a NOFA by late January, a developer who is seeking to apply for tax credits in August of 2023 will not be able to submit a tax credit application if county funds are needed. The next opportunity will be seven to eight months later in the spring of 2024. I will now hand over the presentation to Davia Lynch. Thank you. Thank you, David. We've talked about some of the ways the county is investing in affordable housing across the region. Now I'd like to dive a bit more into how we are facilitating housing specifically in the unincorporated area from the land use policy side of things. San Diego County is approximately 2.9 million acres, of which 2.3 million acres are located in the unincorporated area. The rest are within incorporated cities or non-county lands. Within the unincorporated area, the county's land use jurisdiction is limited by tribal lands and state and federally owned lands, as well as military installation, installations, including Camp Pendleton. As a result, the county has land use jurisdiction over just over 772,000 acres, or 35% of the actual land area of the unincorporated area. The darker areas noted on this map reflect the areas that fall under county land use jurisdiction. PDS is the department for the lead for the long range land use planning for the unincorporated areas shown on the map in dark blue. That includes developing and implementing the county's general plan and zoning ordinance, which together set a sustainable vision and provide tools to implement that vision with respect to housing and other land uses. The county must balance these sometimes competing goals of providing safe and equitable places for all types of housing 
as well as reducing greenhouse gas emissions and conserving important natural and agricultural lands. Where and how we plan for housing is critical to balancing these goals. One of the key roles that PDS plays with respect to housing is crafting and implementing the housing element of the general plan. The housing element is basically the chapter that outlines the county's plan to ensure that the housing needs of everyone in the community across all income levels can be met. The housing element includes many state requirements and is closely monitored by state housing and community development. The housing element includes an implementation plan with 60 programs or policies to be developed by staff to support all housing. Examples include an inclusionary housing policy that establishes a minimum amount of affordable housing that needs to be provided with each applicable market rate development and will be coming to the board in spring of 2023, as well as a density bonus ordinance that provides developers with the option to build additional market rate units if they provide a higher percentage of affordable units than required. We've also identified parcels that have enough development potential or density to develop affordable housing in particular. This is part of our requirement under the Regional Housing Needs Assessment, or RENA. Specifically, under the RENA, the county is not obligated to build or ensure that all the needed housing is built, but our role is to make sure that the county is not creating regulations or barriers that would prevent different types of housing from being built. To do that, we are taking approaches like streamlining or eliminating regulations within our authority. And we're planning in ways that support fair housing goals, like planning for higher density housing, for example, condominiums and apartments, which typically are more naturally affordable, in areas near high-performing schools or other resources like parks and safe areas to walk and shop. The housing element also includes many programs to support equity, like tenant-based assistance and voucher programs that our partners at HCDS implement, and sustainability through efforts like the Green Affordable Housing Study that PDS is conducting. If a jurisdiction does not remain in compliance with its housing element, the jurisdiction may be subject to financial penalty penalties or loss of permitting authority by the state. Additionally, compliance with the housing element is a requirement for the county to receive some of the larger pools of state housing funding and to compete for housing funding grants. The county is facilitating affordable housing in all of the ways noted, but we also create and implement land use policies that support, support both affordable and market rate housing in our unincorporated communities. At the board's direction, we're also looking closely at what we can do to further incentivize development of housing in areas known as VMT efficient or infill areas. These are the locations in the unincorporated county that are the most dense, are closer to transit and services, and that benefit from some regulatory streamlining that could reduce the cost and time for building housing. Each of our actions in 2023 are coming forward in a strategic way to serve as building blocks for the future of housing production in the unincorporated area that is focused in VMT efficient areas where we can grow with a focus on sustainability and equity. Examples of this include creating a proactive approach for a parcel by parcel analysis to identify infrastructure gaps environmental issues or other factors that could be barriers to developing housing on vacant parcels in this v these VMT exempt areas. We're working with our team in the Department of Public Works to analyze infrastructure gaps in these areas currently. And we will be taking additional action with board direction to assess development potential and work with experts, developments and developers and other stakeholders on what is needed to spur development in these areas, potentially above and beyond just meeting our RENA goals. We've also won grant funding for pilot multimodal infrastructure projects as early public investments in some of these areas, like Buena Creek. As part of the parcel by parcel analysis, we will look at how the county can take an even greater leadership role in helping to address these issues and incentivize development of housing and other amenities in these locations. In terms of land use policies, we are also taking the first step in a comprehensive visioning and planning process to develop a sustainable land use framework. This effort will help to create a sustainable vision for the unincorporated area and begin to identify focused plans and programs to ensure a high quality of life across the unincorporated area, both in VMT exempt areas that may see more new housing, as well as those areas that will probably see less development and evolve in other ways in the future. This framework will help us to ensure that our existing communities continue to thrive and that naturally affordable housing is preserved while focusing future growth in areas closest to transit. In January, we're bringing forward an example of an area that is prime for transit-oriented development with the Campo Road-specific plan for the Casa de Oro community, which is identified as an infill area where we should encourage future growth. 
The plan strives to create a walkable, bikeable, mixed-use community. This plan brings into alignment sustainability, housing, and equity goals in a practical way that can lead to real development outcomes. Finally, we're focused on our highest operational priority, which is to fill staff vacancies to ensure that we can effectively implement these innovative programs and process housing entitlements as quickly as possible to meet the urgent demand. The county's housing element includes policies about where and how we must facilitate housing, but it also includes specific numbers of housing at different affordability levels that we need to demonstrate we've planned for and that we're striving to see actually built. These housing numbers are part of the state-required RENA. The numbers in the RENA are based on state calculations of the number of units it will take to meet the existing and future housing needs of the region for residents at all income levels over the course of this eight-year housing cycle which is from 2021 to 2029. For this RENA cycle, the state identified that the regional need is more than 171,000 units. SANDAG then takes that total number for the region and allocates it among the different jurisdictions in the region based on various planning criteria, like proximity to jobs and transit. For the unincorporated area, our RENA allocation for the 2021 to 2029 planning period is 6,700 new dwelling units spread across very low, low, moderate, and above moderate income categories. While we have shown that our general plan has enough capacity or opportunity for various kinds of development to meet the arena, this slide shows our actual progress on the arena regarding what has been built to date. Though the six cycle arena, so the, though the six arena cycle and housing element run from 2021 to 29, the reporting requirements at the state level allow jurisdictions to count housing units permitted for the six years prior to the first year in that cycle. So that would be July 20, uh, 2020 through December 2020, which were accounted for in the 2021 period. We report annually to the board and to the state on our progress in implementing the housing element and achieving the RENA, meaning what has actually been built or permitted. And what we find from that data, as shown here, are a few key pieces of information. We've seen over 1,800 units constructed in this arena cycle. That's since 2021, with some of those additional units counted in 2020, as I mentioned. Overall, we've met over a quarter of our arena goal. In terms of total numbers, not accounting for the important factor of affordability, housing is being built almost twice as fast as required by the arena. Meaning, if the current pace continued, we'd, uh, we'd meet the arena goal in just four years versus eight. However, the arena is not just about sheer numbers. It's very specific in terms of the affordability levels that need to be achieved to really meet the needs of our diverse community. And that's where we find another important takeaway. Above moderate and moderate income, or basically market rate housing of different kinds, is being produced considerably faster than required to meet the RENA goals, while extremely low, very low income housing is being produced far more slowly than needed to meet the RENA goals. For example, 32% of the above moderate and nearly half of the moderate, unit, uh, moderate units or market rate units have been permitted or built in less than three years of, a, of the approximately eight year housing cycle. At this rate, we will exceed the requirement for these categories by the end of the RENA cycle in 2029. However, for the extremely low, very low category, we've only achieved 3% of the goal. At that pace, we would fall far short of the RENA goal and achieve around a quarter of the goal for the extremely and very low affordability levels at the end of the eight year cycle. And finally, for low-income housing, we've met 35% of the RENA goal due to the housing produced by public-private partnerships that the county has contributed to with affordable housing developers in past years that are now constructed or reaching the permitting stage. For the RENA, the county can only account for housing built in our jurisdiction, the unincorporated area. We do not get to count or get credit for those units that we contributed to in other cities or other jurisdictions. Because of the opportunities in other jurisdictions and the county's commitment to getting affordable housing built as quickly as possible, most of our units, or about 90% of our affordable housing dollars over the past five years have gone to housing in other jurisdictions. It's clear that achieving our affordable housing goals this RENA cycle will require increased subsidy and other efforts. But it is not clear whether additional steps will be needed to maintain the pace of market rate development in the unincorporated area. If last year's building trends continue, we will exceed our goals as discussed. But indications are that development is shifting. For example, we saw over 1,800 building permits issued or units constructed last year, 
That included about 400 from 2020. So the actual calendar year number was 1,425 units. We don't have final numbers yet for 2022 since the year has not ended, but it's looking like we're on track to produce about the same amount, just over 1,453 units. I would like to make a correction to this slide, uh, correct the figure for 2022. That number shown at 1,039 is a fiscal year number. For an apples to apples comparison, that number should be 1,453 units. So we're very comparable to last year um, from that standpoint. In addition, the accessory dwelling units, which I'll talk about in a moment, is also a fiscal year uh, figure. However, suffice to say, the trend is there is a substantial increase, which we will talk about. That These numbers from this year and last year are, are more than we saw each year from 2018 to 2020, which was an average of about 1,073 units per year. Before that, in the decade between 2011 through 2020, roughly 600 units per year were constructed. So 2021 and 2022 represent a relative peak in housing numbers in more than a decade. We're also seeing a meaningful increase in accessory dwelling units, as I mentioned. Each ADU is considered a housing unit for RENA purposes. ADUs accounted for less than 20% of the units produced last year, and it's looking like they will be a much higher figure, potentially more than half this year. And we will be back in the spring with updated housing numbers. For context, Five years ago, less than 10% of our new homes were ADUs. While two years is not enough time to mark a trend, there are some trends that we have observed in the past decade that were brought forward to the board with our general plan annual progress report last April. Those trends are that proposals for new larger projects are declining, but we're still seeing the units built now from projects that were approved in the planning process years ago particularly during the 2017 through 2020 window. Housing units from previously approved projects are likely to continue to be built through this decade based on forecasts, though that isn't guaranteed. And new smaller projects have increased by almost 10% overall over the past 10 years. It's unclear whether these small projects will continue to increase. These trends are driven by various factors and individual project circumstances, but they're typically tied to three major factors. One is the economy. A project may be entitled or approved years or even decades before it is actually built based on the economy. A second factor is on the ground realities and constraints. Most of the easy to build parcels have been developed, leaving only those parcels that have physical constraints like floodplains or environmental constraints, which make larger developments difficult. And third, these trends are tied to shifts in policies at the state and in some cases local level that now make development less feasible or more uncertain in areas that are more remote, not close to existing infrastructure or transit. This includes Senate Bill 743 that incentivizes development in more dense urban areas and makes it more challenging in distant areas that require long drives or generate higher vehicle miles traveled. It's also driven by policy direction on climate action and reducing greenhouse gases. With the focus on housing, these early trends suggest it will be increasingly important to focus, to focus on the VMT exempt areas to identify and create future opportunities for development, not only to meet the arena, but to meet the true need for housing. As discussed early, that is the focus of the parcel by parcel analysis that staff is exploring at board's, the board's direction, and we will update you on this early next year. We'll also return to the board in the spring of next year with our general plan annual progress report, which will include updated housing production data from 2022 and new forecast information. Now I'd like to turn it over to Michael Boo. Thank you, Davia, David, and Marco. Now that we have spoken about the current state of housing in the county, the work we are focused on as they relate to affordable housing, land use policy, and our regional housing needs assessment, let me shift to the, your board-directed housing initiatives. Looking back from 2019, there are over 20 board-directed housing initiatives that you have passed. From expanding investments to expediting and changing land use policies, your board is very active in this space and have introduced multiple policy initiatives to try and change the course of the housing crisis we are experiencing in the region. A number of these items have already been completed and statuses on all items are detailed in attachment C to the board letter. To help us organize and better understand the overall direction of our county with housing, we needed a, uh, to map out the remaining in-progress board directives. It was important for us to know where each of the items landed with three important factors. 
Does the directive yield units? Does our county staff have programmatic expertise to implement the directive? And finally, was there identified funding for the directive? Of the 16 in-process board directives, this is where they land based on current conditions. We have also coded them based on their level of funding with green being fully funded, yellow being partially funded, and red being items that are not currently funded and awaiting resource availability. I will note that some of the items that are marked fully funded are specific to staff time. Any actionable items the board may wish to take based on the reports or studies may require additional resources and could change the location of such direction on this diagram. Policy items, though not directly in the middle, are items that can assist in the production of housing with the goals of either streamlining production or increasing access to resources that can cause production of units. What is the bottom line? While a significant number of items are towards the center and fully funded, indicating the best ability to implement, there are still items that may be more difficult for us to implement, resulting in stalled progress towards addressing housing. We need a blueprint to help align efforts and maximize the county's housing efforts. And the 20 board directives have informed us on establishing what is important and we are moving forward with implementing the recommendations that are outlined. For example, Chair Fletcher and Supervisor Lawson Reamer, your board letter related to leveraging government owned land through partnerships with the San Diego Foundation has identified more than 500 units that may be suitable for affordable housing development. Chair Fletcher, after your board letter to acknowledge the impacts of the lack of affordable housing in San Diego and declaring the county's intent to work together to support the region's affordable housing supply via resolution has us aligning our strategies around this objective. We are identifying funding to support the implementation of increasing the region's workforce housing opportunities as introduced by Supervisor Anderson and Vice Chair Vargas. Additionally, Supervisor Lawson Reamer and Vice Chair Vargas your transformative housing solutions that advance equity, sustainability, and affordability for all has us already working with a consultant to further researching options in increasing housing opportunities in these areas. And as mentioned by Davia, for Supervisor Desmond, we have been awarded a Smart Growth Incentive Program grant to fund a community-based transportation program for the Buena Creek area. Collectively, your support of the Innovative Housing Trust Fund not only has created a pathway to building more affordable housing units, but has also been leveraged to rehabilitate existing housing to make them affordable and for vulnerable populations, such as our aging senior population. Outside of these areas, the Emergency Rental Assistance Program has allocated over $200 million so individuals and families affected by the pandemic were not displaced. These are only but a few actions taken thus far. So what does this mean looking ahead? Taking all of the board directives to date, the county's goal to, increasing, to increase housing availability by 2030, we found ourselves laying what could be the objectives and aligning the board directives to these objectives. If we take the draft or initial blueprint and move forward with as written, the next few slides will show you where the board initiatives fall on a timeline of completion, immediate term, short term, midterm, and long term. You may need a squint here to be able to read this. Each of the objectives in the blueprint has associated strategies to achieve the objectives. You will see strategies such as complete parcel by parcel analysis of vehicle miles traveled, VMT efficient, and infill areas to identify development capacity in these unincorporated areas. As directed by your board, create an evergreen fund to support the development of low income and very low income housing units. Utilize the San Diego Foundation's Regional Housing Impact Fund to subsidize development of affordable housing on publicly owned land. Commit to regular annual infusions of funds to the Innovative Housing Trust Fund, creating a consistent source of funding to spur development of affordable housing. Continue to develop affordable housing on county-owned surplus property and invest in property land in the unincorporated area. Ensure more units are coming online each year than new people falling into housing insecurity. Align near-term sustainability criteria with the California Tax Credit Allocation Committee requirements and state mandates to reduce competing requirements for developers and streamline processes. 
align long-term sustainability criteria with the Climate Action Plan and regional decarbonization framework. Explore issuance of general obligation bonds, community-based financing mechanisms, and in lieu fees for developments that do not include off-site affordable, on-site affordable housing, uh, housing. Work with other counties, the state, and the federal government on ways to increase housing availability, including through legislative action. Each of the strategies identified are items that the county can do or work towards to attain the objectives and which all leads to an overarching goal that complements the county's core values. These strategies are directly tied to balancing near-term and long-term priorities and will have a direct impact on the residents in our region as we continue to refine our approach in navigating the housing crisis. To pull this all together, the Chief Administrative Officer will be filling a position within the CAO's office dedicated to implementing and tracking the success of the blueprint. As Helen mentioned, you will also see a recommendation today to authorize a consultant who will work alongside this position to conduct a community engagement that will further enhance the blueprint, steady our organizational structure, including the need for an Office of Housing Strategy, strategy and perform a widespread landscape analysis of where other jurisdictions are seeing major successes in increasing the housing inventory that can be replicated locally within the blueprint and align with your current directives. For the first time, you are seeing all of the current board directives together, so let's go through them. Here are the board directives, directed items that are either complete or will be complete. We follow that up with items that will be complete or worked on in the short and midterm of one to five years. And the final grouping is anticipated to be completed within five to eight years, bringing us to 2030. The turn of a decade 2030 and one of the objectives that your board has adopted for us to attain. Let me know that even if an item is pegged in the long term, that does not mean it is on hold. Far from this. Several of these items are already in the works, but have a long-term needs and are projected to be completed between five to eight years. This slide provides more than the activities that we just outlined. This slide is a more complete picture of all of the moving pieces for housing that are in the works at the county and where they fall in the immediate short, mid, and long term. Items such as housing preservation and anti-displacement, senior housing in Ramona, pursuing funds from the Building Homes and Jobs Act, and so forth. Now let me step back from the county's efforts. We are not the only organization that is looking to tackle the housing crisis. This is a regional crisis, and we are seeing public, private, nonprofit partners who are equally disconcerted and are also focused on addressing it and stepping up. Knowing this, we should be looking at how best to leverage our resources collectively to effectuate the changes that we need to see in addressing the crisis. It may be the case that in some instances, the county may not be the entire ent entity most suited to tackle certain aspects of issues and relying on other regional partners could be seen as the most advantageous path for our communities. For example, as you heard earlier in our discussion, affordable housing is not on track to naturally occur at the rates needed to meet the RENA in the unincorporated area. However, in the area of workforce middle income housing, we are seeing our regional partners recognizing the need to buttress housing to meet their core objectives, including the workforce, their workforce. This is part of staff's proposed long-term focus, a focus that will take time and resources to get to. We are by no means saying we will not be working towards this, but we want to be transparent and make clear that dedicating resources to this effort now will have an impact on our ability to continue deliverable, delivering affordable housing units. In addition, in the unincorporated area, the housing categories that these programs or projects will help with unit development are projected to be met by the market, whereas we are not projected meeting the very low or low income categories without additional interventions, as Davia has mentioned. And while we, the county, may not be able to enter this space without such trade-offs in the near term, there is movement across the region with other agencies to produce such housing and programs being created to assist these populations. Chair, board members, this concludes the presentation portion of the workshop. 
Before going into the recommendations of the board letters, let me stop here and turn it over to Chair Fletcher to move in the direction of discussion and public testimony, as both will surely lend itself to informing all of you on how to proceed with the recommendations. Thank you. Chair Fletcher. Yeah, thank you. Um, I want to go to public comment. I know we'll have a lot of board member comments and discussions, and we're going to want to get into the, uh, the recommendations. But before we do that, I just want to kind of point out that as we work through these issues, there, there's always a lot of challenges around, around how we do it. Uh, I think it is abundantly clear when you look at the number of units that are available in our region and the population of our region, we simply don't have enough housing. Uh, we don't have enough housing to make it affordable for the basic human right and dignity that people ought to be able to afford a place to live. Uh, anyone who works full time ought to be able to afford a home uh, for them and their family, and it's clear that the production of housing is not kept up with population. Now, when you say that and you say that, well, we need to build more housing, that does create by itself, out of any other context, a tremendous amount of anxiety uh, around folks who say, well, that means that we're going to go back to blowing the top off of mountains to build sprawl developments not near anything. And the reality is that that doesn't have to be that way. It is actually possible for us as a county to build more housing and put it in the right places. Uh, and I think this board has been abundantly clear that our focus on housing is going to be to build more housing, but to do it in a sustainable way, to do it in an environmentally responsible way. Uh, and it is entirely possible for us to do that. And so as we have a conversation around the need for more housing, no one on this board is, I'm aware of, is abandoning our commitment to make sure that it's not sprawl and it's not high fire areas that it's done in a sustainable way connected to transportation projects. And I think that this has got to really guide our thinking, uh, that the two can exist uh, hand in hand and go together. The Campo Road efforts are a perfect example of this. What we're talking about and looking at there are a way where you can build sustainable housing in an area where it ought to go with sufficient density to show us increasing uh, the number of units that are out there. And so it is the New York Times had a fascinating neighborhood by neighborhood analysis around GHG levels, showing the infill areas we're looking at building are some of the lowest that exist. It shows us that this is pointing us uh, in the right direction. And so let's not get trapped in the mindset of the false choice, that in order to meet the needs of people who get up and go to work, to make sure they have the basic dignity of a home, somehow we got to destroy the planet in the process. We absolutely can do both. We have to be thoughtful. We have to be careful, uh, but we absolutely can do both. The second thing is we're in a sig significant period of change. The VMT policy is a fundamental transformational change. Recent court rulings, issues of the Climate Action Plan and other things require us to do things in a different way, and that can be unsettling and create some instability. But again, it is an issue that we can work through, and that as a board is what we're talking about doing. How do we make sure we're meeting the need of our residents to build affordable housing and meeting the need of our environment and our community to make sure we do it in the right way? And that has to guide our thinking moving forward. The second point I want to make when it comes to housing is just to talk about the economics of housing. We look at those costs of the cost of housing and we see what it's done. And part of that is land use decisions that get made. Part of that in, in San Diego, we've seen the erosion of SROs not huge numbers in unincorporated areas, but certainly in other jurisdictions that were replaced often by luxury condos. They're often never inhabited by anybody. They're either an investment for people to make their money or they're someone's seventh home. But again, what was zoned to be a unit of housing does not actually impact the market in impacting supply and demand when it's not actually occupied uh, by someone who's there full time. But the production, overall production in total numbers has not kept up with what it needs to either. And so the natural inclination can be, well, then we just need to subsidize the cost of housing. And we're going to have to do a lot of that. The reality is we are going to do that. We're going to embrace affordable housing. Now, we have a lot of work to do on the left side of that chart around extremely low and low. And we can figure this out. We will figure out how we do it. But I don't want us to lose sight that the other way that you can help bring down the cost of housing is to make sure the market rate housing you're building is targeted and focused around those middle income price ranges where the market will still bear it out with a little bit of pressure and maybe a little bit of help, we can still provide housing that is more affordable, not in the very low and extremely low, but in the more affordable range. But also let us not lose sight of the fact that the other way we can make housing more affordable is make sure we're fighting to make sure people get paid fairly. 
We only think about one half, the cost of housing. We don't think about the wages that workers make. And another housing issue is the wages that people make. Because if you put up a chart of the wages of the working class folks over the last 40 years, you would see it completely flat while the cost of everything else has gone up, certainly pre-COVID. Post-COVID, wages have started to go up and those increase in wages have been completely consumed by corresponding increases in inflation. We took action as a board yesterday to say, you know what, maybe we ought to pay our janitors a little bit better. And that's a housing issue because when they get paid a little bit better, they have a little bit better ability because there is not enough public money on the planet to subsidize greed with the exploitation of workers and the exploitation of tenants. We have to make sure that we are not losing sight of those on each side as well. And so I do view efforts to make sure people get paid better as a housing issue as well. And the final thing I'll say is we're gonna have a robust board discussion after we hear from the public, is I think we have to make sure we identify what are the strategies. What are the specific goals? Year over year increase in the number of housing units built in the unincorporated area with regular reports to the board to hold us accountable for are we doing that? Regular progress updates on our, our, our arena goals. Where are we in each of those categories? And third, the implementation of the predictable land use structure that we need in this county. And some of that is gonna take time. Those are our TSGs, our VMT implementation programs, any changes to general plan, all of those things to make sure that the community that builds housing has some certainty uh, around what those structures will be. And then secondarily to those strategic specific goals that can hold us accountable are all of the tactics that we will use to achieve those uh, and putting those in priority in order to make sure we, we have it and recognizing whatever we do today is just the initial effort to begin to socialize this discussion to say, hey, this is a framework or plan, but we wanna go out and get input. We wanna get feedback. We wanna have the chance to develop it so that when we're done, we have a really clear and thoughtful roadmap for how we can build more housing uh, and build it in the right places. And I think all of those things uh, are really important. And today should just be seen as uh, a, another step in our efforts to, uh, to make sure that we, we get this right. Uh, with that, let's hear from our public speakers. And then uh, I know each of my colleagues uh, has a lot of thoughts uh, and discussions as we get. We'll hear from speakers, then we'll come back to specific recommendations, and then we'll go to board deliberation discussion. Thank you, Chair Fletcher. We have 37 requests to speak on this item, 15 in person and 22 requesting to speak by phone. Also note that we received 25 e-comments all in opposition to this item. Any members of the public that requested to speak by phone, please dial into the conference line now using the instructions that were provided to you. We'll begin with the in-person speakers, starting with those in favor of this item. As your name is called, please come forward and stand against the east wall under the murals until it is your turn to speak. I'd like to invite forward the following individuals, Randy Walsh, Catherine Rhodes, Patricia Bauer, John Seymour, and Emily Jacobs. You'll have two minutes to address the board. I'll ask you to please state your name for the audio record. And you may come forward in, in any order. Thank you, Chair Fletcher, uh, Vice Chair Vargas, and the rest of the board for holding the workshop today. I'm Patricia Bauer uh, with the Corporation for Supportive Housing. So I'm here on behalf of CSH to express our support for the actions you're taking and have taken uh, to increase affordable housing throughout the region. CSH believes in taking thoughtful and strategic steps to create housing uh, that is affordable, uh, but we also believe in acting with a sense of urgency that this affordable housing crisis requires. So we see that this is also reflected in the blueprint and the recommendations that are before you today. CSH supports the blueprint and recommendations, and we ask that as you move forward with implementing them, that you uh, seek input and policy analysis and participation from people um, who have personal experience with homelessness and housing instability, particularly black and indigenous San Diegans. We know that for years, black, indigenous, and people of color in San Diego were intentionally targeted and harmed by housing policies. Um, and we also know this has resulted in them experiencing the greatest rent burden and uh, disproportionately experiencing homelessness. So if the harm was intentional, then the repair also needs to be intentional. This includes listening to their voices. So we have to be explicit about our goal of increasing race equity in our housing policies. Um, and again, this includes um, inviting people to participate in the process, to seek their input and guidance in how we do this work. So please know that CSH stands with you. Uh, we support you. We're doing this work alongside you. Um, and we're willing and able to offer any support we can to you all and to uh, the rest of the county. So thank you very much for uh, having us here today. Next speaker, please. 
Hello, Catherine Rhodes, and this is for uh, Ms. Robin Myers. When in 1992, when downtown quadrupled the Center City Project area, they promised to end homeless, and they created this um, cooperation agreement between the city and the county. And so in 2010, I did a public records request, and here's my public records request here. And I found out that the, the county was hoarding $27 million that belonged to the six populations. Um, and you're, it, what, what it is, it's outside the budget process and it gets moved in mid-year. So that's why you don't know about it. Please contact me so I could show you the cash that you exist. Mayor Todd Gloria promised homeless advocates to stop the sweeps. He didn't. Instead, he, you know, he did it. So two of the main um, recommendations that I sent in a letter to you, please request a legal opinion by a state attorney, General Bonta, if government code emergency shelter crisis declarations allows you to open emergency shelters on public or private land ministerially without the need for CEQA zoning public hearings through your public um, agreement. You need the legal opinion so your staff will be able to, to do everything. Otherwise, um, the same thing will happen. And then we also need a new ministerial permit application for emergency shelters, as is required in your housing element um, in the industrial zones M, you know, M50, 52, 54, 58. You don't have that process. That process is not in place. They try to make you do discretionary. And then also for um, Supervisor Anderson, um, Dole Anderson, I really liked um, your ideas for um, shelters at um, Lake Jennings parking lot. There's two areas I really would like to talk to you about Lake Jennings parking lot and the other site um, that you guys took out of consideration on River Fort or the five acre site. And thank you for your support of thank you. Amicus. Thank, thank you. you. Next speaker, please. Good morning, Emily Jacobs. I am a woman of color and a native to San Diego with lived experience. I lived at Lake Jennings for a time in my youth and this issue is generational and it has roots that deep. I also oversee the real estate division for the San Diego Housing Commission. And what that means is I oversee multifamily and single family lending, as well as real estate development, as well as real estate operations. I also have a hand in land use and policy in this space in the county. The solution for homelessness is housing. It's just that simple. It just really is. We need regional collaboration and coordination. We cannot act as if the lending space is Game of Thrones because winter is here. We have to work together. We cannot be siloed. It is not about whose cheese is whose cheese. It is everybody, all hands on deck, working together, deregulating and building in a meaningful way. I wanted to highlight how closely I work with David Estrella and team. We do so in a pressure cooker environment. We do so in a nameless, faceless way, and we do so because we care. And I need to highlight that for all of you. So if we could collaborate and coordinate and work on some very meaningful collaborations. I'll give you an example of an idea within the city of San Diego that touches the county. We want to densify our already owned 175 parcel portfolio that is underutilized. That means we don't have to pay for it again. That means we can just build until it hurts because we need to. We have to act like we're in a crisis because we are. We need to do so together, period. Next speaker, please. Uh, hello, my name is uh, Randy Walsh, and um, I, this is a great presentation. I see it's a lot of work. Uh, it's a lot of work on the front end, and then my question to you is, then what? Uh, I live in affordable housing, and you've just received a packet of materials, um, 143 photographs of conditions at my building. And um, I have been campaigning uh, with Sean Spear, CEO, President and CEO of Community Housing Works for several months now. And the response, the response has been on two different occasions. Uh, I've been threatened with a cease and desist order, and I've been threatened with um, 
restraining order for communicating with their board. There's nothing in here that would really be considered uh, a building code violation. It's got a lot more, it's, there's more to do with uh, quality of life and safety and I just can't seem to get a response from them. I'm raising this now somewhat tangentially to what you're talking about today, but you know, once you build these buildings, how are we taken care of? We're really at the mercy of the landlord. And in this particular case, this landlord doesn't seem to have the money. That's their claim. They can't fix these things because they don't have the money. Well, my question then is, well, who's watching their money? And how is it that they're able to operate this building serving a vulnerable population and not being able to pro provide the product that we're expecting them to provide to us? So um, it's a little bit tangential, a little bit after the fact. You know, you're doing this heavy lift on the front end. But I think it's really important that you know how happy people are. And um, looking at the number of building code violations filed isn't, isn't a good metric. You know, you can get directly to us. Send me a survey about how happy I am living in my affordable housing building. Um, just to get us more involved and to keep these properties up. My property is just a little over 10 years old. And I want it to look like a 10-year-old property. And I don't think that's unreasonable. It was built with certain design elements. And again, maybe that's a North Park problem, but I want them to maintain those design elements. It's what made the building really unique and special. And now those things are being somewhat liquidated and it's, uh, it's just not as, not as good. So thanks, appreciate it. Thank you. As the next speaker is coming forward, I'd like to invite the speakers in opposition to this item. I'll call the first five speakers, so please listen for your name. Oliver Twist, Mark, Michael Brando, Audra, and Peter Sloan. Good afternoon, John Seymour from the nonprofit National Community Renaissance speaking today in general support. Concerned on a couple of items. Um, one is RENA. The county is not being rewarded. In fact, they're being penalized for all of the good work that you're doing at the state. The county is the only regional housing authority in the county, unincorporated area in the 18 cities, but yet all the work that you're doing um, the state's not recognizing that. I would say that we get our heads together on a solution and look at state law to correct this so that you can get um, what you deserve and all the things you're doing. Um, number two, pipeline projects. I looked through the blueprint and I don't see anything there that addresses the over 2,000 pipeline projects that are ministerial and ready to go. These are projects, I count well over 2,000, that have been in the hopper for two to four years. They're CEQA exempt. The land is bought. Some of it's private land. Some of it's on government land. But my point is, is that they're ready for funding applications and they keep coming back and coming back and coming back, like David said, ch -ch -ch -ch, all to be denied or maybe get some money but coming back. Those should be the priority. They're ready to go. For example, um, National Corps and I and my brother's keeper, we've been working on in Cannell Gateway in the double four districts for three years now, four years now. Uh, it's the only BIPOC project in the region, that, to my understanding, 65 homes, youth development, going through the plan check process right now. The other is the MTS government owned site, Palm Trolley Station, Palm City Village, CEQA exempt, same thing. 483 apartment homes, ready to go for funding, child care facility, but there's no local funding today to apply for. The Housing Commission doesn't have any for traditional. The Innovation Housing Trust Fund has zero. So we're waiting and waiting and waiting and we keep processing. Thank you. Thank you. I've called your name, please come forward. We'll go ahead and call the remaining speakers. B. Mittermiller, Serena Pelka, Madison Coleman, and Steph Grossi. Grossi. I used the name Michael, Nathan Fletcher, your last meeting as chair, and here you are holding this uh, ruse where what you've already decided upon is going to happen. So all this minutia and all this data and bantering back and forth is again just for show. It all sounds so, so, so good. It sounds wonderful. But as it's been demonstrated, everything that this board has touched has been contaminated. And that includes on this issue. And one thing I wanna mention, I noticed this in the board agendas and I noticed this in conversation today. This term, lived experience, lived experience 
it's as if anyone who says, including me if I were to say that, lived experience is justification for whatever follows that statement, as if it's right, true, orderly, and what has to come forth. That's a lie. And like I said yesterday, there's so many lies and deceptions that go on here that it makes it almost impossible for any reasonable person to trust what's being put forward. And that includes this agenda item. Next speaker, please. Hi, thank you. My name is Peter Sloan. I live in Golden Hill, <clears throat> and I work at San Diego 350. In 2018, the Camp Fire in Butte County uh, became the deadliest wildfire in California history. In a matter of hours, the fire killed at least 85 people, burned over 150,000 acres, and destroyed more than 18,000 structures. The towns of Paradise and Concow were erased off the map, and the total damage is estimated at $16.5 billion. Butte County was not prepared for the campfire. It, it had been developed for a climate that had already changed. To avoid a similar fate, San Diego County must center climate mitigation and resiliency in all planning and development decisions, especially housing. The housing blueprint must be amended to align with the county's housing policy with its climate, sustainability, and equity, equity goals and policies, including its commitment to achieve net zero emissions by 2035 and the regional decarbonization framework. It must prohibit sprawl development and implement an inclusionary ho housing policy, reversing a history of exclusionary racist zoning policies. It is irresponsible, dangerous, and unconscionable to continue to develop in high fire risk zones as heat waves and wildfires become more frequent and severe. Climate impacts must be prioritized now, not considered in five or more years. The climate crisis is the most urgent planetary challenge of our time with climate impacts becoming more devastating and frequent. Dangerous global heating caused by fossil fuel use is making fires more likely, faster spreading, more devastating, and more deadly. I ask that you not approve the blueprint today and direct staff to revise it to be consistent with the RDF. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Good afternoon, supervisors. This is Madison Coleman, policy advocate with Climate Action Campaign. The housing affordability crisis and climate crisis are inextricably linked. We cannot solve one without addressing the other. Unfortunately, the County Housing Blueprint, a critically important document that will set a vision for all housing and development efforts, doesn't center sustainability enough and threatens to incentivize unsustainable, inequitable sprawl development. The county must align its housing goals with regional plans, such as SANDAG's Regional Transportation Plan and the county's own regional decarbonization framework, ensuring that we develop affordable housing near mobility hubs, job centers, and other life essentials. All county policy must prioritize sustainability, short and long term. Trying to incorporate sustainability efforts, year, efforts years after we've developed housing, especially in the unincorporated area, will make meeting our climate goals nearly impossible. We recommend that the board does not vote on this item until sustainability is prioritized and there is equitable community outreach and input on the housing goals that will have a direct impact on the quality of life of our communities for generations. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Good afternoon, supervisors. This is Serena Pelka, policy advocate with Climate Action Campaign. San Diego is facing a housing crisis and a climate emergency, two challenges that require meaningful, urgent action from the county. The county housing blueprint is critical for determining how these intersecting challenges will be addressed and will shape development in the county for years to come. However, the blueprint fails to consider critical sustainability and equity goals, threatening to incentivize dangerous, inequitable sprawl development. The county must ensure that affordable housing is developed near high quality transit, good jobs, and access to life's essentials. The county should also require new construction and renovated homes to be built all electric. Methane gas is a danger to public health and the climate, and continuing to construct homes with fossil fuel infrastructure 
endangers the health of San Diego families. Appliances and infrastructure can last decades, so it is critical that we start transitioning to all electric homes now and future-proof all development. Developing homes without consideration of climate impacts will continue to significantly harm our communities. The housing goals must align with regional plans and prioritize sustainability now, not in five or more years when it will be substantially more difficult and expensive to remedy inequitable development. We urge the board not to vote on this item until sustainability is prioritized and once there is equitable community outreach and input on the housing goals. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Hello, Chair Fletcher and Supervisors. My name is B. Mittermiller. I'm a volunteer with San Diego 350. <clears throat> Thank you for stating today that there will be significant community outreach and education. Um, that mitigates my uh, opposing this blueprint because I believe that that will happen and that um, comments will be taken into consideration for the final blueprint. Um, Thank you, Chair Fletcher, for your comments in uh, introducing this topic. Um, my hope is that <clears throat> the, county, the county's housing blueprint reflect the county's sustainability and equity goals and policies as described in the regional decarbonization framework. It should also ensure that housing policy prioritizes county resources for building affordable, inclusionary, sustainable housing in infill areas throughout the county, but primarily in the incorporated cities. Land use strategy is incredibly important. Once land is taken for thoughtless development, it is rarely reclaimed. Sprawl development does not benefit those most in need of affordable housing. It increases distance, distances to jobs, therefore making it more expensive to get to work, and it adds to congestion and greenhouse gas emissions. It also increases the cost of creating and operating transit due to longer distances. Sprawl development destroys critical wildlife habitat and, con and carbon sequestering land, which are both essential for meeting county climate goals. And perhaps the most tragic consequence is that building in fire zones is reckless and will harm the welfare and potential wealth generation of first time home buyers. Thank you for your time. Next speaker, please. Great midday, supervisors and staff. My name is Stefan Gross, but folks know me by Steph. Uh, I stand before you today as one of uh, a melanated BIPOC group of housing developers. I'm a junior partner in the new housing development market, so we're the new kids on the block. And what our focus predominantly is, is sustainability and affordable housing and creating the circular economy. I applaud you for the work that you did in the housing blueprint. It looked great. Chair Fletcher, your words prior to introducing public comment, I'm just gonna say yes. I'm confident that you guys will do all of those things. But I believe that the strongest word in the English language is and, and the weakest word is or. We should not go and simply build housing without our and of sustainability. We believe that you are going to do what you're going to do. We simply are asking that you do it with sustainability in mind. Our housing development, we build with seven generations in mind. That means from this point forward, where are we gonna be in seven generations? We not only seven generations from sustainability and climate change and climate action and preparation and economic impact, but generational wealth at the same time. So we take all those things into account. My opposition today is simply taking the vote and asking to pause before we actually take a vote for public input and more uh, review of it. Uh, Mr. Vu's deck presented uh, his regional partners and on there is missing the fourth sector. He had you know, the communities, he had uh, nonprofits, he had government, but what we're missing most importantly are people. The fourth sector are people and that's what we're asking for to pause and not take a vote today. Simply allow the people in the community-based organizations to be able to take a deeper dive and help prioritize sustainability. And with that, I yield happy holidays. Thank you. So next speaker is coming forward. A final call for Oliver Twist and Mark. 
they're not here. He used the name Audra. I mean, just like Michael's saying, it's like, you know, it's, it's, the idea is nice. It sounds good that you guys want to do all of this stuff, but everything that you do is not what you say you're going to do. What I wonder is how much it costs you guys to put this together. And you, you get money. I mean, you've got your 20 board letters, right? How much, I'd have to go back and look, but how many times did you get money in there and what were you doing with it? Claiming that you're going to build housing, and but you guys have like a 90% shortfall most of the time. So, you know, and, and to take six years, it's like, I mean, by that time, how many pe more people are going to be homeless? So you're not even going to be able to give them a house. And I mean, these people even here, I mean, they're talking about being denied, denied, denied. That's what happens. It's like you set up all of these, like, like I say all the time, roadblocks, and you act like it's helping on one hand, but in the end, it's really going against everything you want to do. I mean, this is a very extensive packet. I almost fell asleep back there because it's, it's like I can't listen to you guys just like talk about what you want to do when it's not going to happen. It isn't. And it's unfortunate. But you take all this money and, and what do you do? You create positions. You're not really actually building the houses. You, you do stuff like this. So it looks like we're busy work. And then if you don't get rid of all and spend some money now, right, you're not going to get your money that you need for next year, you gotta give them a projection of what you wanna do, and it sounds really good, right? So they're gonna be like, oh my gosh, take billions of dollars and, and just go do it. But then you got projects where it's like, it's been 30 years, what's, I mean, when's something actually gonna get done instead of just busy work and just fluff talk? I mean, it's pretty crazy. And Nora, thank you that you said that I sound crazy for thinking that it's weird that Gonzalez was here. It's good. Thank you. We'll now hear from those that requested to speak by phone. When it is your turn to speak, you'll be unmuted and you will hear a recording that will tell you to begin your comments after the beep. I'd remind the callers they should mute their TV or live video stream before they begin speaking. We'll start with our first caller. Craig Jones, a resident of the city of San Diego. Go ahead. Um, I, I appreciate the opportunity uh, this morning. Um, I very much applaud the comments that uh, Chairman Fletcher made just before the beginning of uh, uh, public testimony. Um, it agrees exactly with uh, my position in opposition to the written staff report this morning. Um, I live in uh, uh, Supervisor Anderson's supervisorial district, so Supervisor Anderson, I'd like to direct my observation specifically to you. I appreciate it. Um, earlier this year, uh, the uh, board voted to approve the regional decarbonization framework. I provided input on that um, to you, uh, Supervisor Anderson, specifically, and got back a very nice written, handwritten response. Thank you for your comments. I voted yes on this item, passed 5-0. It's an honor to serve you. I appreciate that and recognize that as your, as your uh, commitment to the core value, as the staff mentioned, of the regional decarbonization framework. Unfortunately, for this item on today's agenda, what's included in the staff recommendations would not adequately incorporate the core values of the regional decarbonization framework and the core values of sustainability. So I, with others, encourage the board today to not take a vote on actions, but instead to provide more time to develop this further, to incorporate more sustainability, and to provide for much more public output, uh, outreach. Um, as noted earlier, the county is meeting its overall RENA goals for total development, what's needed is affordable development at the low and very low income levels. That means that it's vital for the county to have a mandatory and preliminary housing Thank you. requirement. We'll now hear from the next caller. Good afternoon, uh, Christina Marquez speaking on behalf of IBEW 569 and our 3,600 union electricians and power professionals, we urge you not to vote on the housing blueprint until there is additional equitable community discussion and, and engagement 
and until the blueprint includes sustainability as a prioritized value in the housing goals. The county needs to prioritize sustainability in both the short and long term and show a serious commitment to sustainable housing development by aligning with the county's land use and environmental team, transportation study guide, sustainable land use framework, the county climate action plan, and the regional decarbonization framework. Reducing sprawl development will reduce vehicle miles traveled and slash GHG emissions. Trans transit remains the largest source of air pollution and GHG emissions in the region. Sprawl development forces working families like our members to make long commutes. Please work on aligning with SANDAG's regional transportation plan and the proposed mobility hubs and development more housing near the employment centers. Also, we need to include good environmental policies on future housing projects that will help reduce GHGs, like the installation of heat pumps, residential solar paired with battery backup, and residential EV charging stations, all of which generate the opportunity for the creation of good paying green jobs so our city can thrive and be leaders in lowering life-threatened GHG emissions. Thank you for your time. Have a good day. Thank you. Now hear from the next caller. Consuelo. Crowfoot stood up and watched as the white man spread many $1 bills on the ground. This is what the white man trades with. This is his buffalo robe. Just as you trade skins, we trade with pieces of paper. When the white chief had laid all his money on the ground and shown how much he would give if the Indians would sign a treaty, Crowfoot took a handful of clay, made a ball out of it, and put it in the fire. It did not crack. Then he said to the white man, now put your money on the fire and see if it will last as long as the clay. The white man said, no, my money will burn because it is made of paper. With an amused gleam in his eye, the old chief said, oh, your money is not as good as our land, is it? The wind will blow it away, the fire will burn it, water will rot it, but nothing will destroy our land. You don't make a very good trade. Then with a smile, Crowfoot picked up a handful of sand from the river bank, handed it to the white man and said, you count the grains of sand and that while I count the money you give for the land. The white man said, I would not live long enough to count this, but you can count the money in a few minutes. Very well, said the wise Crowfoot. Our land is more valuable than your money. It will last forever. It will not perish as long as the sun shines, as the water flows, through all the years it will give life to men and animals, and therefore we cannot sell the land. It was put here by the great spirit, and we cannot sell it because it, because it does not really belong to us. You cannot count your money. You can count your money and burn it with the nod of the buffalo's head, but only the great spirit can count the grains of sand and the blades of grass on these plains. As a present, we will give you anything you can take with you, but we cannot give you the land." Retire, white boy. I mean, I'm sorry. Resign, white boy. <laughs> Resign, white boy. We'll now hear from the next caller. Good afternoon, supervisors. This is Matthew Adams calling from the Building Industry Association of San Diego County. I absolutely appreciate the board's focus on housing and the need to produce housing for all persons. Uh, Supervisor uh, Fletcher, you were on point regarding middle income housing. There has to be continued attention to the middle income housing market. It's really nowhere near where it needs to be and when it's, and it's led to the crisis that we have now. 580 units is nowhere near what the unincorporated area should be producing. And frankly, it's shortage prevents families from moving up the housing ladder and it's the primary reason so many people have left our region and our state. Now, key to our success is the focus on accelerating production through regulatory improvements, including more self-certification, more by right development, and consider a middle income density bonus program. All of this is the goal to maximize the regulatory efficiency with new programs. Let's get product on the ground faster. The BIA asks that you look at the City of San Diego's Permit Now program. 
It gathers all disciplines associated with a project into a room to evaluate project components concurrently, with the end result being a permit in hand that cuts months off the planning process. And any future policy that may affect housing costs or availability must be thoroughly analyzed so that everyone understands the impact before a final decision is made. These actions have consequences and the housing costs continue to escalate. I want to thank you for your time. I thank you for your commitment to housing and the BIA looks forward to working collaboratively as you enter the next stage of this process. Thank you very much. Thank you. Now I hear from the next caller. Hinken. Uh, happy holidays. Um, and uh, anyway, my name is Paul Hinken. Um, I'm looking at the big picture. The um, board seems to want to keep throwing money at the problem. However, um, building houses, refurbishing houses and all is, you know, it's a nice start, but this problem, I think the roots are really that the landlords uh, are want to make a profit and it's kind of like bullies, um, you know, they, they're charging all these rent increases that are higher than the cost of living, higher than inflation. Um, and, you know, it's, as I say, it's like boys. You throw more and more money at them. You give the residents, the renters, vouchers and freebies and everything else, all at taxpayer expense. I mean, yeah, the the um, boys are just going to keep asking for more of these things, uh, and you know, like we'll be paying for this for years. So uh, yeah, it ain't going to happen. So um, in summary, uh, let me say, Nathan, I hope we have. Happy holidays and please resign. Resign, white man. Good. Now hear from the next caller. Good morning. Uh, good afternoon, Chair Fletcher, board members. Uh, this is Dan Silver, Endangered Habitats League. Uh, we support this housing effort and uh, also ask that the blueprint be improved to further align with sustainability goals and specifically to uh, direct housing into municipalities, which are far better equipped to provide services and transit than the unincorporated area. Consistent with prior board actions, county locations should be in low VMT, infill and TOA areas. Extremely importantly, and to echo a prior speaker, uh, new capacity must be kept out of high and very high fire hazard severity zones. It is well documented that lower income households fare particularly badly after natural disaster because they don't have the financial resource to, resources to recover and they end up being displaced. Uh, and in general, please focus on multifamily housing, which is in deficit, the low, very low and moderate rather than the above moderate. Thank you very much. Thank you. I hear from the next caller. Good afternoon. John Brady here with Lived Experience Advisors. I am also a director uh, on, or a member of the Amicus Board and a member of the Housing Commission's leadership team overseeing the implementation of the City of San Diego's homeless plan. Thank you for this incredibly informative presentation today and special thanks to the county staff and leadership who put this together. Leah is made up of people who have experienced homelessness and we stand ready to work with the county in developing and executing these plans. We know that the end of homelessness begins with a home. Let me repeat that. The end of homelessness begins with a home. 
The data is clear. Housing people cost far less than allowing people to die on our streets, hospitals, and, and in jail. Across the county and our country, we are experiencing a housing crisis that is directly, directly impacting our homelessness emergency. Seniors, people with disabilities, working class households, veterans, and our LGBTQ and BIPOC communities are extremely impacted by this crisis. Many things were mentioned to address the needs of very low and low income individuals. One of the things that we did not hear is how to support shared housing. To that, we want to bring forward one, in, by, one idea from a supporter. They mentioned that the county receives two to five housing units a month for back taxes and other reasons. Instead of auctioning these units off, we suggest donating them to organizations willing to create land trusts and operate the units as low income shared housing. As you build a messaging strategy, we also encourage you to consider this. The majority of voices that are resistant to increased housing density are homeowners. They are also the most vocal resisting housing density at community meetings. These homeowners have the good fortune of having largely fixed rate mortgages and therefore do not understand the very real impact of the exploding cost of rental housing. In many cases over the last 10 years, these costs have doubled. Thank you. Thank you again for this informative presentation. Kudos to the Housing and Community Development Department, the Housing and Human Strategies Agency, well, no, and the Department of Homeless Solutions and Equitable Communities. The leadership and staff did an incredible I'm in a little technical difficulty with our call-in system. We're going to give it a moment to reset. Why don't we, while we bring that back online, maybe we can go, uh, Michael, and have you walk through the recommendations for us. Um, and uh, then we'll hear from our final callers and go to my colleagues. Sure, Fletcher's members of the board. There are several actions uh, we are requesting your board to take today in order to move forward with a coordinated and focused approach to housing that maximizes this existing opportunities and resources. In addition to finding that these items are exempt from CEQA, the recommendation in the board letter are received today's presentation, approve the initial housing blueprint, direct the alignment of ARPA funding to the housing blueprint, authorize a consultant contract to enhance the blueprint, adopt a resolution related to the pro-housing program. The county's participation in the state's pro-housing designation program provides the county the opportunity to secure additional funds for the state's housing and infrastructure grants programs. The designation provides additional points in the competitive process for accessing state funds. Staff is requesting that the board adopt the pro-housing resolution and direct staff to officially submit a pro-housing program application to the state's pro-housing designation program. Seven, determine no changes are necessary to board policy A68 on affordable housing expedited review. This policy establishes an expedited review process for projects that provide affordable housing 
regardless of the percentage of affordable housing that is included in the project. The policy provides a valuable incentive for developing affordable units by reducing project review timelines for eligible projects at no additional cost. If directed by the board staff, will develop for the affordable housing expedited review process as part of the inclusionary housing program, which is anticipated to be presented to the board in spring of 2023. PDS staff is requesting that the board extend the deadline of policy 868 until the board adoption of the inclusionary housing program. Eight, authorize the alignment of sustainability criteria to the TCAC requirements. And lastly, direct the CAO to report back on the blueprint quarterly. Those are the recommendations, Chair. All right, great, thank you. Let's go back to our public speakers. Thank you, apologize for the interruption. We're gonna go back to Andrew Weiss. Hello, my name's Andy Weiss, and uh, I'm a resident of San Diego. Um, and a, a professor of urban and environmental history at SDSU. I live in the Golden Triangle. Uh, first, I wanted to thank uh, the board for your public service and also for the very calm and serious way that you approach it. I appreciate uh, Chair Fletcher's comments about the need uh, for a balanced uh, approach to housing that uh, avoids sprawl and sustains our environmental commitments and produces new and affordable housing. Uh, and so in that context, I'd urge the board to um, continue work on revising the housing blueprint to ensure that it prioritizes development of affordable housing in the right place, including transit and job-rich areas like my neighborhood. Uh, in my view, the draft housing blueprint needs a revision because it tends to sacrifice climate equity and environmental goals essential to the viability of a city in this arid region for uh, unfortunately outmoded and uh, unsustainable sprawl. Uh, I would just re, uh, reiterate what many speakers have said about sprawl. We know that it's more damaging to native habitats and biodiversity. It's more expensive to serve with infrastructure, more harmful to climate, more dangerous to live in, and more inequitable for uh, many of its residents, and pe especially people who are economically marginalized. By contrast, focusing new housing, and especially affordable housing, uh, that arena numbers show we need, uh, in it already developed communities can help to maximize the use of transit, to reduce vehicle miles traveled, to shift transportation uh, towards more sustainable forms of transportation, to reduce greenhouse gases, to reduce infrastructure costs, and also to enhance equity uh, by maximizing economic opportunities for people who live in job-rich areas. Um, and so I would encourage the county to revise the housing blueprint, uh, to align the housing policy more consistently with our critical climate equity and environmental programs and policies. Uh, to give us a progressive blueprint that supports affordable housing where the jobs, the infrastructure, and the facilities. Thank you. I hear from the next caller. Good afternoon, Chair Fletcher and Supervisors. My name is Karina Gonzalez, and I am with Hammond Climate Solutions Foundation. The housing blueprint blueprint being considered should not be approved today as it does not adequately consider climate, sustainability, and equity goals. It is extremely irresponsible and dangerous to continue to develop in high fire risk zones as heat waves and wildfires become more frequent and more devastating. I'm happy to hear that community outreach will be conducted prior to approving a final plan, but um, I do not think that this plan should be approved today. And um, ask that you direct staff to come back with a plan that prioritizes sustainability and infill development. Thank you very much. Thank you. Now here from the next caller. Hello, my name is Shaka Ayala and I'm a poly school associate with PANA located in City Heights. We believe the housing blueprint under discussion today should not be approved just yet. The blueprint drafting process lacked community engagement because it was not shared with the public and stakeholders for feedback. We believe the Board of Supervisors should take additional meaningful steps to engage with a variety of local stakeholders and draft a blueprint based on robust community feedback and engagement. In addition, we believe the blueprint largely focuses on the production of housing. We, uh, we believe it does not sufficiently address the preservation of existing 
affordable housing or prevention from displacement for families. According to the San Diego Regional Task Force on Homelessness, the unhoused population has increased by 10% since January 2020. We know that a critical step to preventing displacement and homelessness must be protecting people from displacement, especially our San Diego tenants. That is why the Board of Supervisors should consider pursuing strong tenant protections in their blueprint. Stronger tenant protections that provide safeguards, especially for those experiencing no-fault eviction, will help keep families housed and preserve the affordable housing we currently have. We at PANA would like to be given the opportunity to provide additional recommendations, such as this one. For that reason, we ask the Board of Supervisors to delay voting on the blueprint to allow the necessary time needed for community engagement. Thank you. Thank you. Now here from the next caller. Good afternoon, Board of Supervisors. My name is Andy Kopp. I'm calling on behalf of the San Diego Housing Federation. Uh, I want to thank the staff for a thorough presentation today. We know that it's a lot of work, and this county is uh, just in recent years starting to stretch its muscles um, on these issues that had been ignored for uh, decades. Um, as you all know, that this, this uh, challenge is extremely complex, and not just because um, so many people are rent burdened across our county, but because the state is also taking significant actions that we're not necessarily aligned with. And so as it pertains to the blueprint today, we're asking that the Board of Supervisors send the blueprint back to staff for about 90 days, 60 to 90 days, so that we can have an opportunity to come in and make sure that the priorities are aligned with efforts that are already taking a place in the, at the state level. Um, we are also concerned a little bit uh, with the, um, with the uh, absence of opportunity zones in the priorities. Uh, one thing that we're extremely concerned about is the idea that uh, far-flung development um, puts pockets of poverty in places where people that will live in those homes won't have opportunities uh, to get into job centers, to get into places with high quality of life, and that we will be isolating people and compounding low quality of life. And so we wish uh, ask for a 69 day extension and that the staff be directed to engage stakeholders, um, including the climate equity stakeholders. And uh, thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Now I hear from the next caller. So normally it's bottom of for this current caller, Noemi, uh, we're having difficulty okay. hearing you. So as long as for Noemi, we're having difficulties hearing you. We'll come back. That's all day. Pretty much. We'll come back to this call. Good afternoon, Board of Supervisors. My name is Anjali Kalanog, and I am here on behalf of the San Diego Regional Chamber of Commerce, whose mission is to make the region the best place to live and work. Thank you to the board and staff for convening this workshop to meet the challenge of addressing our region's housing crisis. As partners in many regional efforts to increase housing production, we ask for continued regional collaboration and public engagement in future policy discussions. And as we have in the past, we will continue to support policies that will help create new affordable and middle-income homes and ways where we can make it faster and easier to build these homes, how we can create more certainty and reduce regulatory barriers that delay projects. We look forward to working alongside the county on housing affordability and homelessness solutions in the future. Thank you. Thank you. We'll now hear from the next caller. Truth, housing tragedy, that's right, Michael Vu. What have the 20 board letters since 2019 accomplished? Not Jack. According to the county numbers, all goals are below 45% which means these supervisors have all failed every single housing goal. You guys don't even know if the housing will really be affordable or not. 55 to 99 years? What a joke. Did your supervisors know that 
the medium income would be way higher if he didn't lock down the county for two years and destroy all the small businesses, all the jobs, all the incomes people used to bring in. And these supervisors know that by accepting all the state and federal Biden inflation debt dollars, that you're actually contributing to the cost of prices going up and people becoming homeless. This item alone is $64 million in American Destruction Plan Act debt because less people are working, collecting COVID checks, socialist direct assistance checks, racist skin color checks, housing checks, and all the other made-up checks that become the money buckets that you all collect at taxpayers' expense and at the country's expense and permanent debt and permanent increasing inflation. Ratcliffe was wrong on economics, and you guys are failures in your decisions. You really think people want your ugly, sustainable, slate gray, stack and pack prison block housing project? No, they don't. It's the booster of housing options. I demand Turbo Man quality housing. That's a Texas-sized single-family home with five acres of land, two bathrooms, four bedrooms, two floors, and I want it at $300,000 maximum. Now that's affordable. I don't want your smart city mobility hub prison cells for $600,000 plus in downtown living with the rat. Keep it. Thank you. Now hear from the next caller. Uh, good afternoon. Paul Downey, President and CEO of Serving Seniors. And I strongly support the blueprint and commend the county team for its thoughtful presentation and comprehensive recommendations. The lack of affordable housing for older adults in San Diego is beyond acute. The combination of demographics and economic insecurity is an impactful one-two policy punch. By 2030, all baby boomers will be over 65, meaning one in five Americans will be retirement age. The Elder Index, which is the most comprehensive assessment of economic security for older adults, tells us that two in five seniors in San Diego don't have enough income to meet their basic needs. We're having challenges now meeting those needs, especially housing. That is why an aggressive, proactive plan like the one before you is so critical. I have a couple of observations on the plan. First, there should be an emphasis on targeting new senior housing at the lowest possible AMI levels. At Serving Seniors in, in our housing complexes, we have many residents whose AMIs are less than 30%, but because they have no other choice, find themselves in 35, 40, 45, and sometimes even 60% units uh, because there's nothing else available and no subsidy there for them. We also know that one in four people on our streets are seniors and that the overwhelming majority are economically homeless. The second observation, as an affordable housing developer, I appreciate that the blueprint makes recommendations to streamline the development process. Uh, Mr. Australia, in his presentation, talked about the, the sort of convoluted federal, state, local process, and it takes way too long, is way too cumbersome, and is way too expensive. And I think a focus on that will help expedite more affordable housing. I appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you. Now go back to the previous caller, Noemi Abrego. Hi, good afternoon. Um, so I actually do work with the public and one big problem that we have with our retainment of people that, you know, are in the fence of leaving San Diego and, um, you know, wanting to have that rent cap here where it's cheaper somewhere else to live at, such as, for example, one of my friends just left to um, Arizona because it's a lot cheaper there. So I don't know if that could be feasible or somewhere, you know, as a suggestion for, you know, the, um, the board, that would be great to, um, you know, be able to help the public in that realm to um, do this. So, you know, that's, Sorry, it's running. So anyways, that's that's about it. Um, so I, I appreciate, you know, this coming forth and the developers involved in this. And um, pretty much that's it. Thank you so much. Have a great day. Thank you. And Chair Fletcher, Hello? that concludes public comment on this item.
Thank you. Uh, let's go to uh, Supervisor Lawson Reamer and then we'll go to Vice Chair Vargas. Great, thank you. Um, so I first just want to start by thanking staff um, for all your tremendous work on this important item. It's a huge undertaking to compile all the guidance and directives that have come from the state and from the board to develop a clear and coherent housing strategic vision to guide the housing, the county's housing efforts. Um, and I really do think you've done a wonderful job of setting the table for this important discussion here today. I also thank all of our speakers and community who came out to testify because we all know how important this issue is for all of us across San Diego County. So thank you for being here. Thank you for participating. Um, your input is incredibly valuable and really, really helpful. Um, housing is at the heart of so many critical issues facing our communities, everything from equity, health, homelessness, education, expanding opportunity, basic human dignity, sustainability, and environmental and climate justice. I know we've had a lot of board direction and interest on our housing efforts, including much that has come from my office, and we are all very interested and invested in our housing solutions. Um, and I've previously, um, over a number of months, along with my colleagues, outlined a strong policy vision of where I think we need to go to make housing more inclusive, equitable, and sustainable for all San Diegans. So I'd like to start with some remarks to frame our discussion, and then I'll end with a motion I'd like to propose to move this work forward. So first, I think we need to start by getting the goals for our draft housing blueprint right. We need the right policy goals so we have a North Star that gives us direction for all of our object objectives and strategies to move towards. If we do not have the right goals, then the rest of the objectives and strategies will not be taking us in the right direction. If I wanted to give directions to guide someone to Encinitas from the San Diego County Administration Building, and I said, go north, that is not incorrect, but it's also incomplete and not specific enough. Incomplete directions are just as likely to lead you to Utah or Eugene, Oregon, or even Vancouver. So back to the housing blueprint. The overarching goal identified in the initial housing blueprint is to, quote, increase housing inventory. This policy goal is incomplete and underspecified. It leaves out essential goals that are already part of this board's policy vision and adopt as actions and could lead us to outcomes that are at odds with our core priorities. I'd like to see us align our housing blueprint goals with SANDAG's housing acceleration program strategy, which includes the five Ps of housing. These goals are one, produce housing for all, two, promote equity, inclusion, and sustainability, three, preserve vulnerable housing, four, prevent displacement, and five, protect tenants. These policy goals offer a more complete housing vision that encapsulates much more of the work that the county is already doing, what the board has already directed and prioritized, and that we know and the community knows to be important. So when I look at the current goal, I'm struck by what is missing. I think missing is a focus on affordable housing, attainable and workforce housing, housing that is not currently getting built and which won't be built without leadership from the county. That focus was reflected and uplifted in the slide deck, but it was not encapsulated in the goal, which I think is really important. We do not need to be fixing what's not broken, and we're already exceeding uh, de demand and projections for housing construction, especially I according to our arena numbers, housing construction for the wealthy. We instead need to be focusing on the missing parts of our housing production, the projections that are very low, and this is for low and very low housing, as well as working class and middle income San Diegans. So also missing is a focus on environmental sustainability and our many often reiterated board commitments to tackling our climate crisis. We need goals that more clearly align with our already adopted policies and frameworks on sustainable and equitable development. This means first and foremost, alignment with our newly adopted transportation study guide which is meant to unlock development opportunities in the VMT efficient infill areas of the county while halting sprawl development of McMansions in precious natural habitat. This board has already committed to taking strong action in our TSG and regional decarbonization framework to radically increase housing in infill areas near jobs and transit and to stop building in the wrong places in unsustainable ways and places. This important Sustainability work needs to be centered in the housing strategy. 
Further, environmental sustainability and environmental justice impacts more than just where we build. It also impacts how we build. We need to uplift building electrification, rooftop solar, energy efficiency, and native landscaping. Also missing in the draft goals is a regional approach, an approach that leans into building housing where it makes sense to build housing, to strengthen and preserve communities and near jobs, amenities, and transit. This explicitly includes the incorporated cities. A regional housing crisis cannot be solved through a piecemeal approach, so we need to partner with cities. And finally, we're missing a focus on preservation, displacement, and tenant protections. This means preserving existing, naturally occurring affordable homes, like mobile home parks, for example, and protecting tenants from displacement. Because housing is not just about units being built. Housing is about people. Housing is about community. It matters where we live. We need to ensure that we are not bulldozing naturally occurring affordable housing, that we are protecting senior mobile home parks and supporting tenants and responsible landlords with legal services and eviction prevention programs. So once we clarify the right goals, the objectives will need to be revisited and revised to advance these goals. We should include the following three objectives at the minimum, as well as obje additional objectives based on board, board office direction and community engagement. One, advance housing production by accelerating housing in VMT efficient and infill areas near jobs and transit in alignment with the county's TSG net zero carbon commitment, RDF, and state mandates such as car plans. Second, advance housing equity and fair housing by focusing affordable housing production in high opportunity areas in alignment with state TCAC criteria. And three, advance housing across the region of San Diego County, especially including within the areas of incorporated cities that are near jobs, amenities, transit, and, and or otherwise meet our sustainability objectives. So with all this in mind, I would like the, to make the following motion to kick off the discussion here today. Do we have, do you have it? Great. Fantastic. Um, first, I, would, I move that we move forward today with adopting recommendations one, two, six, seven, eight, nine. Second, I do not support adopting the housing blueprint today. It needs significantly more community input and board direction. So I move to amend recommendation number three as follows. Direct the CAO to conduct community and stakeholder engagement and update each board office before returning to the board with revised goals and objectives within 90 days for a board discussion and consideration for approval of the goals and objectives. The approved goals and objectives will inform the strategies, programs, and priorities. Direct CAO to align the blueprint with the Sandag Housing Acceleration Program strategy and make additional revisions to the goals based on feedback from the board discussion today and from the public. Amend the overarching housing goal, amend the, uh, sorry, excuse me, amend the overarching goal from increased housing inventory to align with the five Ps in Sandag's Housing Acceleration Program and read, produce housing for all, promote equity and inclusion sustainability, preserve vulnerable housing, prevent displacement, protect tenants. Add objective, objective six, advance sustainability, sustainable housing production by accelerating housing in VMT efficient or infill areas near jobs and transit in alignment with county's TSG net zero carbon commitment, RDF and state mandates such as car plans. Add objective number seven, advance equity and fair housing by focusing affordable housing production in high opportunity areas in alignment with state TCAT criteria. Add objective eight, advanced housing across the region of San Diego County, including within the areas of incorporated cities that are near jobs, amenities, transit, and, and or otherwise meet our equity, community, and sustainability objectives. Third, regarding the ARPA Evergreen Fund, recommendation number four, reject recommendation number four. Staff should continue developing Evergreen Fund concepts with the fiscal subcommittee and return to the board with options for discussion. We can align the timing of the report back on Evergreen Fund concepts as needed to correspond with ongoing discussions and work around the housing strategy blueprint. The housing blueprint will need more time to revise the goals and objectives before we even get into the specific strategies and priorities, so the timing doesn't make sense to align the Evergreen Fund to a housing blueprint that doesn't yet exist. 
This evergreen fund idea was approved by the board to be evergreen, meaning it is constantly renewing itself to support a range of potential housing and behavioral health efforts. The fiscal subcommittee is in the process of working with staff to come back to the board with evergreen fund concepts for consideration. The time frame of the evergreen fund report back can be postponed if needed to better align with ongoing discussions around the housing blueprint. Fourth, regarding the hiring of consultant to support a potential office of housing strategy, recommendation number five, I would like to amend recommendation number five as follows. One, direct the CAO to incorporate board member feedback received in our board discussion today regarding the principles, considerations, and qualifications for the consultant and the potential office of housing strategy prior to releasing the consultant's solicitation. And two, to include a focus and expertise regarding equity, sustainability, human-centered design, and community-based approaches to building. So in light of that motion, I do want to share my input now regarding the qualifications and scope of work for the proposed consultant and the assessment of a potential housing strategy office. In my view, consultant qualifications should include experience accelerating housing production, demonstrated experience in human-centered de human design that is bikeable and walkable, and a community-based approach to development, expertise in zoning, land use, and building investments that advance transit-oriented, mixed-income, mixed-use communities near jobs and amenities. Expertise in accelerating housing in high opportunity areas, centering community equity and very low, low and middle income housing. Expertise in environmentally sustainable planning that tackles, tackles climate change and preserves our open spaces and ecosystems for the benefit of local communities. Expertise in innovative affordable housing solutions, including affordable housing finance programs. Expertise in planning that advances equity, diversity and inclusion and expertise in the five Ps of housing. Produce housing for all, promote equity, inclusion, and sustainability, preserve vulnerable housing, prevent displacement, and protect tenants. And in addition to what is already outlined in the board letter, I would like to see the scope of work for the consultant include the following. Assess the county's existing activities and responsibilities. Develop recommendations for potential realignments and recommendations to create an Office of Housing Strategy that supports integration across many county functions. Perform a landscape analysis of best practices from other jurisdictions, including global thought leaders like Vienna, that focuses on sustainable, equitable, affording housing developments at scale. Perform a landscape analysis to identify programs and policies focused on sustainable, equitable, affordable, mixed income, mixed use housing developments at scale. Develop policy and strategy implementation recommendations for the county to increase effectiveness in meeting the five Ps. Develop policy, strategy, and implementation recommendations to meet our equity, community-centered, and environmental sustainability objectives as part of our housing work. And identify any resource gaps and resource options for the county to accelerate progress on the housing blueprint. I know that was quite a mouthful, but this is a huge challenge facing our community, and I am very excited that our board is prepared to tackle it. So with that, I thank everyone for your patience. I thank the team for your tremendous work on this item, and I look forward to hearing from my colleagues. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Supervisor Lester. Was your motion everything you said or what's on the screen? It's what's on the screen. Well, there's another slide on the screen that he should move towards, but yeah, it's what's on the screen. Okay. Let's see the other, let's see the other you have slide. Yeah. You just have these recommendations. And then... Yeah, that's, there's, you're missing a slide. I'll send it over. This one? This yeah. one? Mm hmm Exactly. Okay, so it's the two slides or three slides? Let's go back up. Let me see. Let's go slide yep. one. Slide one and slide two. Okay. Uh, the, there's a miss type, um, Andrew, I go back to slide one. Amend recommendation five, that's incorrect. It's a, that's a duplicate of what's on the other slide. And that all should all be gone. No, okay. delete it. It's on the other slide. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, thank you. Uh, let's go to Vice Chair Vargas. Thank you, Chair. And again, thank you to uh, the team for all the work and, and Michael and everyone else. 
um, particularly for highlighting the current status of housing in the region. And I think all of us know that the lack of affordable housing in the region disproportionately impacts young people, working families, veterans, and seniors on fixed income and people of color. You know, housing, st housing stability, safety, affordability, quality, all of it uh, affect also our health outcomes, as does the physical and social character of each of the neighborhoods that our communities live in. Housing is one of the best uh, researched social determinants of health. Housing instability, condi uh, conditions inside the home, like safety and quality, health impacts of the financial uh, burdens that people have, and of course, health, impact, health impacts of each neighborhood, environmental and social characteristics of where people live really determined uh, a person's quality of life. We know that a majority of San Diego County's low-income renters spend more than 50% of their income on rent, leaving little left for basic necessities like food, transportation, health access, and other needs. I strongly believe that the county has a responsibility absolutely to preserve existing affordable homes, protect the families in them, produce more housing at all income levels to address uh, housing abort affordability, and to create a pipeline for generational wealth opportunities. In order for us to accomplish this, there is no just one, there's no one solution about producing, there's no one solution. It's gonna take a comprehensive approach by all government agencies. And I believe that this conversation today is not solely, should not be solely about production, but also about protecting the folks in them. In October, um, I had the opportunity to uh, bring the State Secretary of Business, Consumer Services and Housing Agency, Lourdes Castro Ramirez, and we hosted a, a uh, conversation around building homes and building wealth where we highlighted topics about economic development, generational wealth, health and housing, housing production, and housing development. The topics that emerged from the space included ideas, and this is co community focus, right? The community was able to provide information. And the, the topics that emerged from this space included ideas of revamping development incentives, tenant protections to expanding home ownership, and the need to incorporate more childcare and housing development and expanding access to capital to build generational wealth. The salon created a space that focused on various housing solutions for the region, and so for this item today, I think it's important, and because of the nature of the workshop, I'm happy to support the, some of the recommendations that my colleague presented with, with some. I would like to make some recommendations to you on some of these, but I also agree that it's extremely important that we listen to the public and to have this discussion. Um, we continue to have this discussion as a board. So some of the items that I wanted to, um, to ask if we look at them from a, very, a little bit of a couple of tweaks. First, I actually think that we should adopt the, the blueprint because there was so much work done, but adopt it as a draft blueprint. So I think we're saying the same thing, right? And so that you actually, because when we're recommending the CAO to present it to folks, that it should be presented as a uh, uh, draft blueprint so that it could actually, uh, and it incorporates all of the recommendations that you have, the five incorporated you know, the items that you've recommended. But it's gonna be a starting point so that we can provide so the public has a foundation of something to bring feedback, you know, give feedback to. In, I'm sorry? I'm seconding it right now, so, but I'm making this recommendation. If she, yeah, if just, so, so just to clarify, you're basically saying, make the changes that I, I, I put in here, uh -huh. but then what with those changes, adopt as a draft So draft instead of saying, they come back again. Yeah, because it says housing blueprint, just call it a draft blueprint, right? So that we know that this is a draft because it doesn't have the recommend. We so still the want. So the change would be direct the CIO, CAO to align the draft blueprint. Yes. Uh -huh. With the Sandec Housing Acceleration Program. Okay. Yes. And then uh, and and present it right for feedback from the community. And then there was another bullet where it says, where it says amend the overarching goal for increasing housing inventory. All of that is. It's the next bullet. I'm yeah, the yeah. next bullet. Mm -hmm. Yeah. To actually say, after protect terms, approve. Uh, you know, again to approve it as a draft uh, starting point uh, for our communities. And then the second, the next bullet where it talks about objective number six, right? Uh, I wanna just make sure, I, I think that it's implied, but I just wanna make sure that we emphasize that we focus on equity in our low income populations as Do, well. Would you like to adva um, add advanced equity? Just do it after card plans. After card plans, right? Yeah. Sure. Just yeah, do yeah, a yeah. comma, yeah. advancing great. equity. Yep, mm -hmm. great. Yeah, and then um, and the last thing would be um, when the proposed consultant, and, and you make some recommendations including like, I'm assuming where you says including places like Vienna, um, I, I know that's just the model, but I think I wanna make sure that we're also looking at um, other communities 
in the United States that we are similar to many of our populations because uh, I think the beauty of the difference in some of these um, other countries is that they don't have the same um, government regulations, you know, all of the other things. I but completely I, I, agree. So no, I, I would want us to look everywhere. I yeah. think I'm just like, my emphasis is like, let's get outside the box, okay. right? Like, Perfect. let's not just look so at So is there a change there we need to reflect? I, I don't, I'm just trying to make sure that, do we have to say, do I have to say like, and other That, that wasn't in models? the motion. That wasn't in the motion, it that was in the comments. It was right? just comments. It's okay. just comments? Okay. All right, then with that, I'm happy to second the motion. Okay, great. Cool. All right, motion and second. Go to Supervisor Anderson. All right, uh, Thank you, Chair Fletcher. Um, I have a couple questions of staff. One, my predecessor, Supervisor Jacob, uh, I think put a board letter in a while back uh, requesting staff to come back uh, with how EDU financing uh, could be achieved for low-income housing. As a, as a path to get more of that low-income housing online. I know that the San Diego Housing Commission has a similar program. Are, do we anticipate when that board letter, I mean, when, when we're gonna respond to that? Uh, thank you for your question, Supervisor. Uh, we anticipate we'll be coming back in uh, uh, early next year, early 2023 in the spring. Okay. Uh, thank you very much for that. Uh, I think that when we're thinking in terms of part of the solutions, uh, wherever we need to do, I like the idea of this being a draft so that if this comes back, we could perhaps could get more ADUs online in those first two low and super low income brackets to help. You know, I looked at this and we're talking about Rena, and I'm sorry, I'm still learning an awful lot about this job. Rena comes from the state but do we do any assessment of the community? You know, I look at the housing needs and then I look at in my town halls and I talk to my constituents and I almost believe I can count more people at my town halls requesting housing than is anywhere close to this arena number. I mean, in, my, in, one, in one community, I think we could do all these houses uh, to meet the need. So is there, how do we, do we even look at our actual need versus what the state says our need is? Supervisor Anderson, through the chair. The RENA is a regional number based on data that the state, ha state has, and we consider it a baseline. I think there are a lot of other factors, and perhaps some of my colleagues can talk about those in terms of the social need and the demand, um, but those are, are truly a baseline and a floor from our perspective. You know, I missed the last part. Can you say that again? It was a, oh. Certainly. I said I, I, we view those as a baseline or a floor okay. uh, as opposed to a ceiling of the a reflection of the true need. Uh, thank you. Uh, I, you know, I, I, I pulled up just the slide that you all had, and I added them together. And in the unincorporated county needs for the very low, it's 2,800 plus. And for the low, which is the 51% to 80% AMI, is 60, over 66,000. And I know that when we looked uh, previously at my district, we went from 18,000 homes down to 600. So I'm curious, based on these numbers, without looking at anything else, where in the unincorporated are we going to find the difference when I have a big portion of the unincorporated? Supervisor Anderson, through the chair. Um, we do, so according to the arena, we do have enough sites identified at the appropriate density to, in theory, accommodate the affordable housing. But I, I believe I understand your question, which is really, if the actual need is beyond that, where will we find that? And from, I believe that one of the primary focuses of the parcel by parcel analysis is to take that deeper dive to put the developer hat on, if you will, and bring planning and economic development together to look at those areas and say, what we have on the table today may not be enough to get us where we want to be. It's enough to meet the arena, but it may not be where we want to be or what meets the true need. So how do we create more development potential by identifying vacant areas, possibly coming back to your board to create additional density in those areas, seeing if there needs to be additional infrastructure or other facilities to really spur development and create opportunities that, that may not exist today? 
uh, if we're not able to find it, uh, next to it we have a, a regional need in addition to the unincorporated, and I added those two numbers together and it's over 66,000. Would there be a potential for some of the uh, incorporated communities to fill the gap to make that happen? Uh, you know, one of the one of the challenges that we have is that Sandag is completely left East County uh, out of the mix, right? So a lot of our communities that were scheduled to get a trolley never were cut out in later versions of the trolley. And when you think about where the trolley goes, where it make most sense to build these, uh, many of those communities are are uh, east of the 15, excuse me, west of the 15. And so I, you know, I'm just wondering, is do we have any mechanism to reach out to ask them, or, or how does that, how would that work? Are we all just kind of on our own? Supervisor Anderson, uh, you know, one of the forums for us to have those conversations would be at Sandag, because as we're looking at the vehicle miles traveled and then the responsibilities because as the state provides us with our housing allocations it's at sandag that then the allocations are made to the cities but that's really at the heart of the conversation that needs to occur that if our capacity is 6700 for purposes of rena and we have cities with much larger um, assessments by the state and sandag how are they going to be reaching their goals and achieving the construction that needs to occur, whether that be near transit or otherwise. Um, thank you very much for that. The, um, one of the concerns I have is too often government looks at the perfect, and it's good to strive for the perfect, but frequently it gets in the way of the greater good. Uh, I'm worried that we're gonna talk this to death nothing's gonna get built and we're gonna be in the same place. We started this two years ago talking about how there's a need for housing and how we're gonna increase it. And one of the items I really liked was item number nine. And I'd like to offer a friendly amendment in this draft that you've proposed, which is in the quarterly reports that we receive back that we add two numbers to staff to report. One is the number of permits pulled and to what level of housing it's going to. And the second is the final inspections, or if there's a better way to look at occupancy, but we need to see how many are being completed. So, you know, I'm thinking if nobody pulls a permit, then maybe that climb is too steep and we have to rethink it. And if everybody pulls a permit, but nobody completes it, then there's a problem. I, I, I wanna make sure there's people in the pipeline delivering in the future, and I wanna make sure that we actually complete the job. Uh, you know, one of, the, uh, one, of the, one of the reasons why I ran for the county was uh, my kids, along with so many other of my district's children, have no place to live off of our couch, and they're moving out of state, and I don't believe that we should have to travel to see our grandkids. We should be providing them the same future that we grew up with, and, and when I moved here in 76, it, it was an incredible opportunity and a lot of people moved close to their parents. And today, that's virtually impossible. So we need to change that. And I, I asked for an amendment, so I'm- Yeah, let me, let me ask Steph, with, and then we'll see if they're okay with it. What, what's the best way, permits pulled I think is, is quarterly, but what's the best way to track actual doors or units, bedrooms, occupancy? Yeah, Chair Fletcher, I would recommend uh, certificates of occupancy or COOs. Uh, that's an indicator that the unit is ready, ready to be moved into. Okay, so then what Supervisor Anderson's asking is quarterly uh, the number of, of new permits pulled, the COOs, um, and I might suggest that we would add a breakdown of how that fits in our arena goals so we can see that quarterly as well. Uh, and ask the maker and seconder if you're okay with that. Happy to accept it and love this data-driven approach to trying to meet our housing goals, so thank you. And then the, I have a final two comments. <clears throat> Did we ask in, in moving this forward did the Office of Evaluation, Performance, and Analysis have analytics, have anything to do with our presentation, or have we engaged them in any, any way? Supervisor, that is correct. We have, in fact, in the board letter, we had to actually called that out in terms of having an evaluation piece to, associated with this. Great work. I'm glad that new departments 
hitting the ground running. Uh, thank you. I appreciate it. And by the way, it was an excellent presentation. Juggling all those uh, items and putting them in a format that that uh, I could follow, let alone my constituents, I really appreciate that. All right. We have a motion by Supervisor Lawson Reamer, uh, seconded by Vice Chair Vargas. Any other comments or questions? I have a question. Um, just wanted to ask our uh, CAO, Helen. Um, I, you know, I did list off quite a, a number of specific uh, considerations around the qualifications of consultant. Um, you know, and of course, we'll make that available to you. This testimony is public, but do you need that formally in the motion, or is the feedback sufficient? Um, if you want to be very pres prescriptive with every one of those things that you rattled off, then I think it needs to be included in the motion. I would like to, I mean, I don't want to be so prescriptive that you don't have flexibility to include other things as right, necessary. We call it guidance. If we what? could just use it as a guidance. advisory and then anybody else that would want to give me advisory, then. A, yeah, I'd much prefer to use to it as a that. guidance to shape as opposed to being a straight jacket. Cool. Okay. We'll count it as advisory. Council? Okay, so that would, if it's, if it's guidance, if a particular quali uh, consultant qualification isn't responded to or included, then then it would be considered guidance and not a requirement. That's right. That's what yeah. we clarified. In, in, the, in the actual RFP. Right. Yeah, I mean, I think the question for Helen is, um, do you, and maybe this is a real question, like, I don't want to give you a set of a motion that is such a straitjacket that you can't design an RFP that's appropriate. Um, so I think it's really a question for you of whether it would be create whether you think it's going to be more difficult to include this in a prescriptive way or whether you think that we will be able to accomplish objectives of ensuring that these considerations are met without having to I, be prescriptive. I think the spirit of the, um, rec of the guidance can be met in the RFP. Okay. Based on the, what Thank you have. You. Thank but you. I would invite anybody else um, that wants to give me some other guidance and things that you might want included, let me know, please. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Awesome. All right, we have a motion by Supervisor Lawson Reamer, seconded by Vice Chair Vargas. Please vote. Chair Fletcher, that motion passes unanimously with all supervisors who are present voting aye. That concludes the business before the Board of Supervisors today. Wish everyone a wonderful holiday, happy Christmas, wonderful new year. We will see you all in January. With that, we stand adjourned. The swearing in ceremony for the District 4 Supervisor, District 5 Supervisor, Sheriff, District Attorney, Assessor, Recorder, County Clerk, and Treasurer Tax Collector will take place on Monday, January 9, 2023 at 10 a.m. in the Board Chamber. The event will be broadcast live and seating will be limited. The next meeting of the Board will take place on Tuesday, January 10, 2023 at 9 a.m. with the Board's organizational meeting for the selection of officers for the 2023 Board Term, followed by the Board's regular meeting at 10 a.m.